Okay, yeah, it's all recording. Yeah, it's okay. Ooh, awesome. Nice. <laughs> well, uh, usually I work off a script. Going off the script with, uh, <laughs> with someone, all right, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, you should listen to my videos where I do it all scripted, right? Perfect and all. Then, um, then when off script, I'm saying all sorts of rubbish. Right, so, um... Do you ever find, like, you just need a random subject to talk about? Yes. <laughs> like, like when I'm doing gameplay, like, there's nothing to talk about. I just need something random, and I'll just ramble on for a few minutes. <laughs> I remember bloody, um, uploading a video where I was playing Subnautica, and I was talking about, um, cryptids in Australia in the form of the alien big cats. I think you guys have something similar in America. But, um, uh, yeah, I was talking Wait, about... Hey. What? Alien big cats. Yeah, alien because they're not meant to be in the area. So, um, reported black panthers oh, and okay. pumas in Australia. Which is pretty interesting. Oh, okay. Well, that's different than I was thinking. <laughs> what you were oh, thinking? So I take it you're Australian? Yeah. Yeah, Australian. <laughs> oh. Alright, okay. Um, I, I don't know. From our text, I got the impression that you're like, you were also in the States. <laughs> and then I heard like that accent, like, okay, maybe not. <laughs> so I wasn't sure. Yeah, maybe he's not from here. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, just... mem I remember trying to do that video of playing Honestly, some Nordica. I mean, if you're talking like actual English, you are not from the United States because no one actually tries in the United States. I remember Gecko saying to me when we were recording a video together, he said, right? Uh, uh, he said of how it seems like people in Australia seem to speak English a lot better because everything in America is just, hey dude, bro, brosome, oh, my parents. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's... It's pretty much, yeah, it's pretty much like... And then it's often like when foreigners learn English, it's like, wow, that's really good English. <laughs> I have yet to hear English that good. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, my my only experience, my best experience with, like, Australia is all the Bluey that I keep watching, and I force my wife to watch with me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember hearing something saying that apparently some kids in America have started developing Australian accents because of that show. And even learning Australian <laughs> slang. Honestly, I wouldn't mind. It sounds nice. <laughs> It sounds nice. So, do you guys, you guys say letterbox instead of mailbox? That's what I get from Bluey. I, I just call it a mailbox, yeah. Not letterbox. Oh, oh, okay. Alright, Bluey lied to me. The lie has... So, I didn't do actual research, like... <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of one thing I saw yeah, of some... The furthest of my knowledge is Bluey and Steve Irwin. Yeah. Oh, yeah? It reminds me of one thing I saw of this one American woman who came to Australia and she said they're saying of how great it is to be in Melbourne, Victoria. Uh, over here in Australia we pronounce it as Melbourne, even though it is spelt like how you're meant to pronounce it as Melbourne. We just call it Melbourne. Also, from what I know, Melbourne is a horrible place, so don't go there. But anyway... I did um, not know that. I did not know you pronounce it like that. Yeah, we also pronounce Brisbane. Uh, is it always rainy? Melbourne changes a lot, uh, but where I live, it's pretty dry. Okay, so where are you in Australia? Are you like, because I know it, like the climate varies significantly depending on where you are. Like some parts are, like you said, drier. Some parts are like jungly. I'm in one of the more desert type areas of Australia. Okay. Okay, so yeah. I, I did tell you I'm from New York, so I don't, I'm not like a southern accent kind of person. <laughs> yeah, not. I don't have any rodeo hat on me, but. <laughs> <laughs> the rednecks, <laughs> there's something else. <laughs> no, I'll tell you that um, as long as you're not in a city, it's not even like a north south thing anymore. It's just like. Once you're in the woods, everyone thinks they're redneck. <laughs> so the further you get from the city, the more redneck it gets. You'll it see like Confederate flags in New York. <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty crazy. It reminds me of one book I have that I got called *On the Prowl in Search of Big Cat Origins*. 
and I remember skimming for it once, and they had something there <laughs> of like of how um, for conservation in America, we could bring African lions over to America to fulfill the niche that the American lion once did. And I remember actually making a community post about it, and I remember saying something like, you do understand the rednecks would shoot them all, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, they die pretty instantly. Like, once someone sees a lion with a chicken in their mouth, they're, they're getting shot. <laughs> Sorry. Next minute you have good old Cletus with one, uh, mount, with one mounted on his F-150. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you see this lion head sticking out from the grill? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a dream come true, honestly, for a lot of people. Like, oh man, yes, it's lion hunting season. Let's go. <laughs> Get the gun, Cletus. We're going lion hunting. I, honestly, I... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we still have a problem with um, uh, what's the bow? It's oh my gosh, it's leaving my head right now. Uh, the pythons in Florida. Burmese pythons. Like, I don't know how those Floridians haven't just murked them all. The Burmese pythons in Florida. I don't know how they haven't just murked them all. Made, uh, like, lots of new belts and leather boots. Uh, the snakeskin boots for all of them and purses. We just need to get an army of rednecks and send... Well, they're already down there. Just get an army. Send yeah. them out. Kill the snakes. I remember... I remember I was watching something about the Ukraine war once, and I remember them saying we should just send rednecks to Ukraine. Not money, not weapons, just rednecks. I could imagine <laughs> the war would end <laughs> instantly. They'd Pretty need, effective, I'd say. They need to add something to the Geneva Actually, Convention I mean, yeah. regulating them. <laughs> They're a force with in and of themselves but i i, I teach um u.s history and yeah. i could say that like one of the best well i want to say best one of the say most powerful things why the confederacy was so hard to defeat is that they have like a such a military culture down there like um a lot of generals come from the south so they had that military culture and experience that a lot of the northerners didn't have so mm. they were able to hold out for like uh four years four years longer than they sh could have otherwise sorry i just like uh, <laughs> i teach this stuff and i like geeking out over it <laughs> it's like me with the alien big cats i mentioned earlier i'm always finding excuses to talk <laughs> about them I think are there is... any snow leopards found in australia i doubt it <laughs> apart from zoos no that's about it. Oh, okay. Is, what's your take on... I know it's like a common meme that everything in Australia wants to kill you. I mean, clearly you've been living there, so you're doing fine. Uh, is it true? Do you actually, like... I hear people have doubts about that, but I want your take on it. Like, are you in peril whenever you walk outside, or do you feel safe when you go outside? Uh, it's pretty safe here here i mean you have anti-venom and everything so it's pretty rare to get killed by the snakes and other venomous creatures here i mean yeah sure there are quite a few people bitten if i remember correctly the eastern brown is considered the most uh, dangerous snake in australia not only because it's one of the most venomous being the second most venomous snake in the world but um because a lot of people are bitten Oof. by it each year uh. A lot of people live in Eastern Brown Territory, uh. so it's also known as the Common Brown. But um, besides that, really, there's not too much to worry about. I mean, you might look and go, oh, there's crocodiles, but they're only up in the northern parts of the country. And from what I know, uh, in terms of like attacks, they're very rare. Because, well, most people know, don't go in the water. It's only the stupid tourists who are like, oh, let's go skinny dipping in croc territory. That sounds like the start of a bad horror movie right there. Yeah. I think it should also be pointed out that, well, unlike with America, we don't have stuff like bears and mountain lions. <laughs> That's true. They're, they're more of a nuisance, like just knocking over trash cans, though. <laughs> I don't know about people like that. It happens, but it's not like a common thing where someone will get mauled by a bear or mountain lion either. But I, I I heard that, yeah, Australia wasn't as deadly as the memes, but I wanted your own take on it as 
an Australian yourself. If you go back like 50,000 years when we have stuff like Phylaca Leo, Megalania, Diprotodon, then yeah, it's more dangerous. Don't don't forget that monstrous oh. eagle <laughs> they found this year. Oh my gosh. Yeah, like largest eagle found in Australia. Still slightly smaller than like Hass eagle, right? But still yeah. a behemoth. Yeah, for more, I know it's up there, but it's probably Oof. not going to have the same bulk. Mm. One thing Was I- it true that, like, t- would Hass eagles, like, eat, say, like, Aboriginal people in New Zealand? I don't know. Or is that just paleo art, kind of? I don't know much about Hass eagles. That, that also sounds like a horror movie right there. Mm. Oh, so what were you going to say before? I don't really know that much about Hass eagle. All I know is it's the biggest eagle so far found. <laughs> it's it sounds like death from above, and I I don't know if I can deal with that. Things uh, that fly, I don't want to fight that. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of the big cats I mentioned earlier, said to be prowling Australia. Someone actually shot this feral cat, and it turned out to be, if I'm incredibly as long as I am tall. I'm like 175 centimeters. This thing is believed to have been at as little as 170 centimeters long, total. Wait, okay. I'm trying Wait. to do my American math here. My American brain. <laughs> Hang on, I'll Google it. What's f- um, feet okay. to? So it's, I guess it's a little less than two meters. Alright. Okay, so centimeters, 170 centimeters. Uh, that's five and a half feet. Okay, alright. So, not like... Okay, alright. So about like average height. Yeah. Actually, hang on. I'll send you a photo of it. Okay. This is a forced per- perspective <laughs> shot, though. So it does sort of throw the uh, length off a bit. But the, it was actually confirmed to be this sort of length. Oh my gosh. Is that like... It's is a, that like an invasive species of a cat, or is that like that's the feral cat like in a Australia? House cat. A house natural cat. selection just boosted it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the tail alone was like sixty centimeters, oh. which is. I've, Let's. Uh, I think it's like twenty-five and a half seven, twenty-five and a half centimeters to a foot. So this thing was like over two feet. Uh, with the tail alone. <laughs> I, I do like that. The Australian looks... He, he could pass as an American. <laughs> so we're talking about the rednecks. You know, it, it makes me feel homely. I... <laughs> but yeah, um, there you I'm go. I'm always just... a proud of the cat right there. I remember posting Is about that. Is that cat's head blown off? <laughs> yes. Redneck. <laughs> I remember oh, posting man. about it on Twitter with the caption Poor of something thing. like, random thought, this thing could take a child. It, it really can. The cats are just like murderous beings. My, my wife has a cat and it's just happy to murder literally everything in her path. Anything small in her ends up as flesh on the floor. <laughs> so, may, maybe, uh... <laughs> murderous maybe he demons. did a service to society, I don't know. The year, um... Alright, uh, I guess get to the questions. So with the podcasts and all that, what I was thinking of doing is having just two types of questions for each person who comes on. The general questions, which everyone who comes on is being asked, and then the specific ones. Uh, so I guess let's start with them. Uh, yeah. The general questions first. Uh, what would you say got you interested in dinosaurs? Oh, alright, oh, that's... Tough That's question. a difficult question. I mean, it's the first question, but I'm already struggling here <laughs> because uh, it's, I mean, for as long as I could remember, honestly, I've been into dinosaurs. I, I can't remember a single time in my life where I haven't loved dinosaurs. Um, but growing up, I had a few influences that might have caused it, but I can't pinpoint to any specific thing. Um, like... I don't know if my parents are bad parents, but they, 
when I was in the crib, I was already watching Jurassic Park. And I know a lot of people got their start with Jurassic Park. Um, especially, like, older people in the 90s, but... Mm. I was 99, and as soon as I was born, I was already watching Jurassic Park. Which, which is good, because I have a hot... I grew up with a high tolerance for violence and, like, horror. So while other people are like scared and crying during the movie, I'm just like laughing at them or looking at them like they're like weirdos. Uh, they're also showing me Jaws and like Temple of Doom. Yeah, like yes, um, you have a two-year-old child. The f- exactly what they should be watching is someone getting their heart ripped out of their chest <laughs> in a ceremony. <laughs> um, so there's Joe. Ju- oh yeah. Normal parenting in America. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it's surprising because you know I have uh, like Christian conservative parents who not overly protective. I can still watch things, but mm-hmm. I don't know, man. Some things just flew under the radar. <laughs> um, so there's um, Jurassic Park, like a lot of people. Uh, the Land Before Time movies. Mm-hmm. I don't remember ever getting them. I all I know is I had a whole collection of the first eight on VHS, and I would watch them a lot. And I had an older brother who was also like really into dinosaurs, but uh, he he was a big influence on my life. We're we're pretty close. We're still pretty close today. Um, so anything that he was into, I ended up getting into. He fell out of dinosaurs. He he knows like a lot of general stuff more than the general public. He he has a vague understanding of what's going on still. But uh, I stayed in love with dinosaurs while he moved on to other things like like music and stuff like that. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not sure exactly where it all came from, but one of those three candidates are to blame for this. <laughs> Pretty much sounds like me. I just got started at some point, and that was about it. <laughs> yeah. Then How I just, old are you? Do you remember? Uh, I'm 17 years old. But but like when you started? When I have started. no clue. Probably like three. Oh yeah. See, like it's just it's such an innate thing for some people. It's like. <laughs> at some point, at some point it began, and my life has never been normal. <laughs> but, but okay, I'm like freaking out. Like, whenever I hear someone is like 17, that means you're like a 2006 child. Yeah. That means that, oh my gosh, I, I can't fathom people being born like past like 2002 or something like that. That means like I watched. The Incredibles in theaters, Spider-Man 2, Finding Neo before you were in existence. Like, I just don't have my teach students. It just, it blows my mind. Sorry, it blows my mind. I'm not, sorry, I'm a boomer. I'm aging myself. All right. (laughs) Old man at not even 30, I'm guessing. (laughs) For me, no, I'm I'm 24. This is how fast the world is moving. I'm feeling like... (laughs) <laughs> yeah it it goes by really fast and the older you get the faster it goes like okay that's boomer advice a boomer would tell you that but here i am telling you that because it's actually true at 24 oh my goodness <laughs> yeah sometimes i already feel old like i'm out of touch i don't know uh the music i don't know the fashion i don't know the slang anymore and if i try to say anything that's in style, I, I just look like a weird old guy. So it's a wake-up call for me. All right, I guess we uh, move on to the next one. What got you interested <laughs> in YouTube? Oof. All right, so this one I can't remember. I was I'm old enough to remember when YouTube first became a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it started in 2005-ish. Yeah. And... Well, it started with horror for me. Me and my brother, you're going to hear him a lot because he had such an influence on me. Uh, but we were really into horror. Um, like, 
-hmm. the horror games at the time, like Bioshock, Dead Space, some of the Resident Evil games. And we would watch old YouTube videos like Machinima, where they were ranking horror games and stuff like that. And I just got into watching all of these video reviews. So my channel didn't actually start off as like a paleo channel as it uh, got famous for. I'm called the Red Raptor Writes because it was more about writing and film and video games. Mm -hmm. um, so I started like going from there and watching movie critics like Jeremy Johns, Chris Stuckman, um, Movie Bob is a controversial one, but I liked his movie takes. I know he got in trouble with some of his personal takes. Um, but I was really inspired to be a YouTuber. Now, uh, I, I didn't like quit my day job or anything. I, I know that like barely anyone, a small percentage of people actually end up making money, less end up making a living on YouTube. So I still followed a, like another career as a teacher, but I want to be a YouTuber on the side. And if mm. it blew up, then it blew up, and that would be great. It reminds me of one oh, thing. So it was... No, no, yeah. keep going. No, no, what thing does it remind you of? <laughs> uh, well, I remember watching something of... I think it was back when the Ukraine war started. The game War Thunder, they decided to disable their oh. in-game chat because people were just going on there and starting all these different controversies in the in-game chat about the war. So they disabled it. And I remember there was this one YouTuber, the European Canadian, where he started defending them. And I remember someone said of how the only reason he's doing it is because he's getting money from all the views. To which I remember the European Canadian just replying saying that they actually worked it out on one of his Twitch streams, I think it was, um, of how much money he was getting. And if I remember correctly, he said he was getting like below like half the minimum wage of Canada, where he lives. So, um, like I remember him saying, he's got a job that he actually oh. does. YouTube is just a side project. Oh, wait, it was, was he defending the invasion, like, from Russia's standpoint? <laughs> no, he was defending Gaijin, uh, disabling their in-game chat in War Thunder because they didn't want um, people associating the oh, game okay. with War Thunder because Gaijin is this company that's Russian, so then people, you know, they're asking straight away, are you supporting Ukraine? Are you supporting Russia? This, that. Alright, just trying to drag them all into this, because, yeah. oh, it's a military uh, game and it has Russian tanks in it. When it's like, no, they're a business. They want to make money. They don't uh, care about a war. <laughs> right, that's... Yeah, yeah uh, and that's a tough spot to be in, like, having to defend, or, I mean, they don't have to, but being asked about all this, and maybe even, like, Russian businesses, Russian citizens being kind of blamed for it, when maybe they don't even like the war themselves. Uh, I'm not sure... From what I've heard, a large chunk of the Russian... Putin actually is. From what I've heard, a large chunk of the Russian population doesn't like the war going on. And same goes for a lot of the Western that, that countries also. Sense. Well, hey, as far as I've seen it so far, it's yeah, just a I mean, pointless forever war. Right, it seems like like a just a stalemate, and they're stuck in this war yeah. with the incompetent leader who's just forcing them into this. As far as uh, I see it, it's just a way for companies the to make money. The... As far as I see it, it's just a way for companies to make money. Because, like, you know, oh, donate to help like save military Ukraine. military industrial complex? Yeah. Oh, donate to help save Ukraine, this, that. Oh. Put the Ukraine flag in your Twitter bio to show your support. Thanks. When, in reality, oh, man, we, got, we got political fast, but... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm honestly... I don't know how fast people are going to cancel me online, but uh, uh, I usually... I, I don't delve too much into politics often, but yeah. uh, I'm inclined to agree, like, I, I don't like invasions, I don't want them getting invaded, I hope <laughs> it comes to a peaceful resolution, and I feel bad for the Ukrainians who deal with this, but hmm. at this point it's like, our politicians are more concerned about funneling money overseas rather than spending that money at home where people yeah. actually need it, well, where we mm. need it and are... Uh, cities are kind of deteriorating, so it's... 
it's well, frustrating like you want to help yeah. but you have to help yourself you have to be able to stand on your own two feet before you can help other people right well i love one thing i saw from british prime minister or former british prime minister brian johnson where he went something like of oh we're no longer huh. going to be buying gas and oil from russia and instead we're going to be doing it we're going to be buying from china because we don't support russia's invasion of ukraine <laughs> The funny part is, is that if I remember correctly, China gets their stuff from Russia. So you're still supporting Russia. Right. They're... Right. They have close ties to each other. They support each other. <laughs> so I'm just trading stupid, in one authority the other one. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we're getting Wait, it from this other person. So far, what was... What was the original question? <laughs> Forgetting at this point. The original point. question was, what got you interested in YouTube? And I think you said it was just um, all the horror videos you watched with your brother. <laughs> then we just got <laughs> on and on into Ukraine yeah, war. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that would be so fun to talk about like, as like a channel, being like a geopolitical channel. I mean, fun as in like being a commentator, not as in this is... Um, a good thing, of course. Mm. <laughs> um, but, uh, like, I started as a movie review channel. I used to be, uh, Tim Rex, actually. That was my old name. I was Tim Rex. I did movie reviews. And even with Red Raptor Rights, I was... Tr I rebranded, but I still wanted to do movie and game reviews. Mm -hmm. But, uh, it got to a point where it's like... And I was spending so much time on these videos. Uh, they get like a hundred, a few hundred views. Like, it's not really worth it. So what works? I noticed that a few of my uh, paleo commentary videos got like a hundred thousand views. I'm like, all right, let me just keep doing that if that's what people want to see. So then I just went with what the demand was. Uh, I, I, I still do some film and game stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, it reminds me of with uh, my paleontology videos. My T-Rex video took off, and it's now nearing uh. 9,000 views, right? I think that was back in November last year, so uh -huh. it, it's a year old now. And then I remember, as soon as that got a lot of views, I just ended up doing one on Acrocanthosaurus. That's at, like, nearly 6,000 views. Saurophaganax, that's at nearly 4,000. Um, Mapusaurus, that didn't even get 1,500, sadly. Uh, did a couple reviews of Dinosaur King. Those got like 8,000 views total uh, combined. So yeah, I was pretty uh -huh. happy with all that. So I just kept doing that and now I'm at the point where I am now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess that's how you're supposed to do it, right? Like follow... Follow whatever works. What do the people want to see? Well, whatever, like... It's, it's so hard to make it. Like, you just kind of have to... Mm -hmm. Go with the flow, kind of. Yeah. Right? And I wish you all the success and all the luck. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to hit the subscribe button now and see. <laughs> Go through your content as soon as we're done. I want to check it out. Indeed. <laughs> all right, so uh, <laughs> next question, I guess. Any, any particular projects you'd like to make for YouTube? Hmm. Um. More Dino Doc I, reviews? Like. No, I kind of. I've done a lot of Dino Doc reviews, and the Prehistoric Predators one kind of burned me out. Like, there's so much content in that. Um. I, I will return to that. Right now, I'm finishing up my Land Before Time reviews. Mm hmm. Um. I enjoyed doing. Yeah, so going through the whole series and reviewing them. I just recorded um, part 3, so I, 9 through 11, and then next time I'll get through 12 to 14. Um, I, I've kind of... I, I don't want to say I've done everything, but like if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, <laughs> I'd be satisfied with how far I got. Right? Um, one thing I really wanted to do was, I like, I do like ma making movies, so I made a Bioshock fan film, Bioshock being my favorite game. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I'm happy with how it turned out. 
and oh oh um i'm gonna build up to it do a few more releases before then but i really want to dive into nano tyrannus as uh um, another series i have aside from the uh, aside from the Dino Doc Dino reviews is paleo myths yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. uh-huh so um scripting one about raptors hunting in packs Mm -hmm. Whether that's true or false, and outweighing the evidence, but I do want to get to uh, Nano Tyrannus because there's been such a big back and forth um, mm. on this subject, and I've uh, I've always been of the opinion that Nano Tyrannus is a juvenile T Rex, mm -hmm. but I do want to give the other side their fair shake and kind of see if I can I can be convinced either way, because. Mm -hmm. I do find it interesting that some people say that uh, there's a different shaped uh, brain in there. I think that's interesting enough evidence to give it more of a look. So I want to give them their fair shake. So um, a few more paleo myths and I'll, then I'll get to that one. Hmm. How about you? Is there anything that you really want to do? Uh, well, I have some interesting videos I was thinking of doing. Like, um, well, with the Australian cats I mentioned earlier, one thing that's been proposed behind the sightings is that Phylaca Leo oh. is still alive. And I'm interested in doing a video going over whether or not Phylaca Leo is actually still alive. In case you're wondering, what's my personal take, just from the research I've done uh, from oh, reading yeah. on the Australian oh. cats? Uh, no, Phylaca Leo is not alive. And if it is, it's... That would be, that'd be really surprising. <laughs> and, uh... Like, if, I mean, it, yeah. If, if Phylaca Leo is still alive, it would not be behind the cat sightings for multiple reasons. Uh, uh, like, like, what reasons? Like, well, I mean, it looks very different yeah, than a cat. I remember watching something from, I think it was PBS Eons, where they did a video on Phylaca Leo, and they said that more skeletal material was found more recently, in like 2018 or something, and they found that Phylaca Leo wasn't much like a cat, and actually resembled more like that of a giant Tasmanian devil. Uh, so there's one nail, nail in the coffin. Yeah, isn't that... And yeah, that would be like its closest living relative, right? Moino is more closely related to wombats and koalas. So it oh, seems oh, like it's more a case clear. of convergent right, evolution. That's inspire some paleo art. So it seems like it's more of, or well, the build is uh, more of a result of convergent evolution with Tazzy devils. But yeah, um, oh, that's really interesting. Another uh, one of the things yeah. is that um, canines are described for these cats, but the, well, if you look up. Uh, for like a Leo skulls, you'll see that the teeth look nothing like a big cat's, and they'd be pretty recognizable yeah, if more... you saw this animal. Yeah, they're more like giant razor blades, right? Than like actual teeth. If I'm remembering. Also, if I'm incredibly, there was a um, there was a journalist who investigated all the Australian cat sightings and reports. Uh, his name was, I think, John Higgins, and he made multiple different generalizations based on his investigation, and if I remember correctly, zoologist Malcolm Smith, in his book, Bunyips and Bigfoots, said that all these generalizations clearly spell out cat. So it appears that what we have instead is actual pumas and black panthers roaming the continent, and not Phylacaleo. The cat aspects of it all are just too perfect to be just coincidence. Right. They're too cat to not be cat. Yeah. Like uh, that's such an interesting. I I've never heard about Thalacaleo still being alive. I I've heard like rumors about Megalania still being out there somewhere, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, that was actually one. Um, Smith covered. Guess... That was one covered in Bunyips and Bigfoots by Malcolm Smith. Actually, let me just read out a part of that to you. <clears throat> Should be allowed to. Hopefully I don't get, like, copyright claimed or whatever. Alright, so, um... Let me see Maybe if you read it like a Morgan Freeman voice, they'll leave you alone. 
<laughs> okay, the area of Lodestone, seven miles south of Queensland border, seems to have been a hive of activity. Stan Lon Lomond often had to put down cattle whose legs had been burned off by the monsters. He's talking about um, giant goannas in the area, monolizards, so presumably Megalania. <coughs> In 1955, loggers had to move, had moved into the cedar grove of the Lomond property and quickly became acquainted with the giant goannas. One man had two fingers burn off. Indeed, the loggers would only work in the early morning and late afternoon to avoid the brutes. All this appears to have gone unrecorded by the press. Immediately, I read the art. Immediately, I read the article. I wrote to Mrs. Lomond's widow, widow, and received the following response. The whole article is just a lot of rubbish. There is only one line of truth in it, and that is that Lodestone is about seven miles from the Queensland border. We have no cedar trees, no scrub, and certainly no giant lizards. We would like to know where Mr. Gilroy got his facts from. As I said before, I've never been impressed by Rex Gilroy's pronouncements. So by the looks of it, Megalania is a hoax. Even the testimony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, like, if you have... Fingers bitten off by Megalania. That doesn't sound like Megalania. Megalania is gonna rip your entire arm off. <laughs> I'll step back thinking that I don't as well. Know if like, it's gonna how do you your fingers? Yeah, and well, you not just that, oh, but I think it should yeah. be pointed out that gun laws at the time were much more free in Australia. You mean to tell me no one ever shot one? Uh, right, something that big would have trouble hiding. Yeah. There was a lot. Of, like, there was a lot of the points Smith went yeah, over when he yeah. talks about it a bit more in the book. I highly recommend getting that book if you decide to get into cryptozoology. Bunny up some Bigfoots. Right. You you recommend or don't recommend? Recommend. So. Highly recommend. Oh okay. One of yeah, the cryptozoology. Uh, it's not something I ever I haven't gotten into it. I mean, I kind of hear mumblings here and there, but I don't know. It'd be interesting to look into. That'd be cool. I remember being sat back thinking it would be interesting to see you cover like some of these reports of Australian megafauna still alive, supposedly. But uh, I guess we'll see. One video. It's cool to see it all all that tackled because mm. there's so much misinformation out there about these subjects. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you should see some of the hoaxes you get when it comes to some of these um, Australian cats I've checked out. If I remember correctly, um, some dude ended up writing an entire book claiming he's seen Philakaleo and going over the evidence. <laughs> I'm actually planning to get that uh, book at some point and actually analyse it myself, so who knows, maybe he might not be as loony as I think he is. I doubt it, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing about science, right? It's peer reviewed. You get to look at the evidence for yourself and be like, well, this was trash. <laughs> well, that's the thing with science. Science uh -huh. isn't just, I believe, it's the case of, well, you know, you have hypothesis, you test, you analyze the data and come to the conclusion. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, it's a process. Yeah. But, man, I can't help tell you, one of my biggest pet peeves is just all the Megalodon stuff <laughs> that I see on social media, like on Facebook, Instagram, just, ugh. The thing I find most to funny... perpetuate the myth of a Megalodon. The thing I most find most funny no, about what? the Megalodon stuff is you'd think, after countless videos, uh. ranging in view count and research effort from me... All the way up to actual shark experts, people would have learnt by now it doesn't exist. <laughs> but no, no everyone's but still said they're like, be out is there. One or two. One or yeah, two it just bad. Takes one or two bad documentaries with fake actors that, well, with actors as fake scientists, to just totally misinform the public. Yeah, there really it's, needs it's to be. It's weird. It's. Uh, there needs to be quality control on documentaries. Right. Or at least they should, like, say, like, give a clear warning, like, hey, 
what we're about to show you is fake. This is, you know, for entertainment. And then show you the documentary and you have fun with it and like, haha, wouldn't that be funny if this were true? But no, they just release it and be like, here, make up your own mind about it. Or Being just, very misleading. Or just go at the end like, April Fool's. <laughs> just completely fool everyone. <laughs> like, hang on, wait, that wasn't real? <laughs> okay, um, next question, I guess. But, like, okay, yeah. Up. Uh, no, if you want to say something, go on. Oh, uh, I was just gonna say, like, it should be so obvious. Like, we would 100% have found Megalodons by now <laughs> if they were still alive. Uh, These coastal, like, whale-eating sharks. Just some people shouldn't be allowed like, on the internet. Uh... <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> well, alright. Yeah, next question. <laughs> Thoughts on modern paleo media? Oh, you mean like, uh, Just like prehistoric planet, life on our planet, documentaries, Jurassic TV World shows, stuff. movies, yeah, all that. Okay. Um, it depends, because there's always a range of quality out there. Mm hmm. Um, even myself, like, in my documentary reviews, kind of, like, call, like, the walking with time, like, oh, this is the golden age, the dark age, here's a resurgence, like, but there's always good stuff and bad stuff out there. Like, I mean, I really like Prehistoric Planet. I had some gripes and nitpicks with it, but overall, I really liked it. <laughs> um, and I tried, I tried watching Life on Our Planet, I watched the first episode, but it seemed like really disjointed and all over the place and kind of hard to follow. Yeah, I agree. Even I know. I just <laughs> liked of how they kept jumping between yeah. like the prehistoric stuff and then modern stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that, and then just jumping between time periods <laughs> and the theme seemed to be like rules of nature and evolution, but it was kind of a very <laughs> broad theme that oh they didn't really mm. seem like they just took a bunch of random stuff and mashed it together I so I don't know if the show gets any better I remember just yeah. being sat back thinking like skip all this stuff about bugs and sexual displays I want to see the Allosaurus <laughs> that's all I was thinking <laughs> throughout the entire film that's what we're here for <laughs> I want to see the Smilodon come yeah, on like skip a... skip <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't blame you for that. I don't blame you. Like, it, like show me the good stuff. <laughs> show me the interesting stuff. It's it, like watching um, an action movie and skipping through the stuff we're talking. <laughs> like, um... In terms of, like, other paleo media, I think... I don't know. I'm... There's nothing that I'm, like, in love with right now that, like, I'm like, you gotta watch this, you gotta see this, you gotta play this. I mean, Prehistoric Kingdom is probably my favorite thing from recent times. I, I, I love that game. That has um, such great dinosaurs and other animals, such great designs. Uh, it's very fun, like, park builder so far very easy to make great exhibits but aside from that prehistoric planet hmm. kind of at a loss for honestly me, for me so like, far the main uh, yeah the main paleo meter i've just been having interest in is uh just books reference books that's been my main interest like um one book I ended up getting for Christmas, I think it was, was Dinosaurs, How They Lived and Evolved by Darren Nation and Paul Barrett. Um, I got that last year. And Ooh. then, just last month, they published the new edition of it, where it has um, Spire Story on the cover, and it just looks awesome. So I hope to get that for Christmas this year. And uh, also, if you're interested in picking Ooh, up... I might need to add that to my Christmas list. I'll send it to you, but um, also alongside that, next <laughs> year, they're also publishing the third edition of The Complete Dinosaur, which is, as far as I know, one of the best books out there on paleontology. And then also alongside that, 
uh, the third edition of Gregory Paul's The Princeton Field Guide to Dinosaurs will be published uh, around the same time. So I hope to get those for, I guess, uh, my birthday. <laughs> I actually I actually have the second edition of all those books. They're pretty good. And, like... Do you find that, like, the books are kind of, like, very up-to-date in terms of the science and the portrayals and all that? Uh, well, I remember referencing, uh, I was talking with some people in a, uh, Discord server about, um, Triceratops weight, because someone said of how Horridus weighs, I think, like, only six tons, that's what they claimed, to which I responded by saying of how Gregory Paul's... Nah. Uh, second edition of Prince and Field Guard's Dinosaurs said Horridus weighs nine tons, and then everyone was just well, someone was just shouting me down, going, "It's outdated because it's seven years old." And I remember they said of how the paleo art on the cover is inaccurate ah. because it's shrink wrapped. But I think these people forget that Gregory Paul is known for the shrink wrapping, like that's he's the main person behind it. It's still a good book either way. Right, like his depictions. Yeah. yeah. It's like, ignore the illustrations, just go with the actual text itself sort of book. Because there is still a lot of good <laughs> See, stuff in there. I just... Yeah, I, I wish I had more time to, like, sit down and read books, because... Mm. I, honestly, I don't read. <laughs> I just I can't find a time for it. And... Mm. Uh, it's hard for me to, like, find something that like I get really into reading hmm. uh, I, so uh, a good a good dinosaur book like recommendation yeah, these are very appreciated if you could drop them in the chat too so like I can just go back to them yeah yeah I think also, I will do you find them like readable like um like if someone's like me and they're not like <laughs> they, they don't They'd much rather play a video game or watch a movie than read. Would, would I still be able to, like, get I'd, into it? I'd recommend, if you want something a bit simpler and easier to understand, uh, get Darren Nation, Paul Barrett's Dinosaurs, How They Live and Evolved. Um, Princeton Field Guide to Dinosaurs, that's <laughs> also a good book as well. It's very easy to understand and read. Um, the Complete Dinosaur, that, if I remember correctly, it's also meant more for the general audience, but there is some more technical information throughout the book. So, um, make sure to learn all the big brain words. Like... <laughs> like, um, Arcto-Metatarsalian condition that... <laughs> um... Like, English, please, I can read sir. scientific paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I, I can get through, like, a scientific paper or article, because I have to do that for research on um, my videos. Mm. But that's more like... That's when it becomes work for me. It's yeah. not like a hobby where I can sit down and like sip some coffee and read the latest journal, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's why oh, I like. Oh, that's something. I use a lot of books yeah. for videos because I just like. It just feels better to sit down and read than stare at this screen of blue light hitting you in the eyes. And that's a problem. Right. And not just uh, that, but... Glasses for that. Glasses help. Yeah, I got the glasses. <laughs> but yeah, um... <laughs> it does just feel a whole lot better to actually just sit down and read. Because, not just that, but you also never know what you might find reading through some of these books. Because there is just some really inf interesting stuff <laughs> you can find here and there. Like, uh... Well, I never, yeah, re like, I never really uh, knew anything an about, um... I never really knew anything all that much about why lions had manes until I actually read through books I got on cats for videos and just because, well, I'm interested in cats. Hence why I have a snow leopard as my profile picture. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> and, Top tier. And it was, so cute. It was interesting to read through on um, the lion's mane, right? Where it is... Well, most people... Well, some people think it's for huh. protection... Right, because well, how are you going to get through all that hair? But um, I remember reading something saying it's not that effective at protection, and the actual reason lions have manes is for sexual display, because um, the mane actually, in terms of its growth, it actually indicates the health of the animal overall, 
And not just that, but the shade also indicates the level <laughs> of testosterone. So the darker and fuller the mane is, the more healthier and stronger the lion is. There is there is even a That's study. That's really interesting. There is even a study done, if I remember correctly, <clears throat> used interchangeable manes on these life-sized dummy lions, and they found that lionesses were attracted to the <laughs> darkest-coloured dummy lions. Ugh, those giga Chad. <laughs> Yeah, so when Long, you think about it, handsome. in the in the original Lion King, Scar is just a Giga Chad and uh, Simba's a cuck. <laughs> oh my god, he's a soy yeah, no boy. Gonna want to be with Scar. Uh, oh my gosh, Beta Simp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's I- I've heard the protection uh, hypothesis before. Mm-hmm. Um. But sexual display, that's not something you really think of much happening in mammals. That's that's yeah. really interesting. I didn't know that the darker the... Oh my gosh, I'm about to... <laughs> I'm gonna have a deep... I'm not gonna go that far into that. <laughs> I'm gonna not get cancelled today, but... Uh... <laughs> if I remember correctly, we also found yeah, that young... That's insanely that the, uh, the cubs of these darker-maned males also live longer and um, have higher survival rates. And that uh, rival males stay away from darker maned lions because they know they're an opposing threat. They know the capabilities of those darker maned males. Those are the voided out lions that have that testosterone boost, then, huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I remember one of those cringe. A, like, like animal fight channels popped up on me once and they had a video of like the top 10 strongest subspecies of lions and i remember just getting like this weird shiver because they had a line in the thumbnail that had a mane was that was almost like completely black so i remember just being set back thinking to myself like don't want to mess with him all right uh, hmm that's Man, I haven't heard that before. That's that's new to me. That's news to me. I'd have to, I'll have to use that as an example in a video. That's really interesting. Do any other cats do that? Or anything similar to that? I think I... I remember once I was watching this meme compilation video with... I think it was my sister and dad. And um, they had something there of... Oh, did you know tigers have these spots on the back of their ears to protect themselves from predators? Because they think there's an extra pair of eyes. I actually read through a book later, Alan Turner's The Big Cats and Their Fossil Relatives, where I remember they actually mentioned these uh, spots on the back of the ears of tigers, and they said they're actually a sexual display item uh, for memory. But uh, beyond that, I don't really think many other cats... Are they like the little... Beyond that, as far as I know, not many cats actually have yeah, sexual display. Are they like display. little tufts of hair? They're just these spots of, like, white on the back. Huh. How does that work in sexual display? Like, flick their ears? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see if I can send an image, or is it just gonna... Hang on. Here's an image I can just copy-paste to you real quick. So they are relatively recognizable. Oh, they, they do kind of look like eyes. I can see where that comes from. It looks like a Gungan, kind of like if Jar Jar Binks is looking at you. <laughs> oh, Cha Cha. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I can't really think of... That's cute, though. Well, now that you say that about sexual display in mammals, I can't really think of, like, any others in terms of sexual display items on mammals. I mean, the only one I can think of, really... I, is like the muscles on men and um, breasts in women. That's the best I can think of. <laughs> the boobs. <laughs> I remember actually reading something saying that they did actually de- that humans did develop actual uh, breasts as sexual display item. So I found that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> boobs. Well, you know what? I'm not complaining. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is, this is gonna be the downfall of both of us. <laughs> but he's gonna have. They're gonna have a great time with this video. <laughs> oh, you can imagine already next minute. Oh, oh Calvin the Carnotaurus and Red Raptor Rights support Ukraine. No, 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 wait, they support Russia. Oh my god, cancel them now. 
He s he implied there's only two <laughs> genders by saying men and women. What about cis? I mean non cis people. <laughs> non cis, more like nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, that's one thing they tried to go after me over. <laughs> I said two genders. I made a joke about it in a video, and you had people complaining about it on Twitter. I have this YouTube series right. I do. You know what? I have this YouTube series I do on a second channel called Sabaton Random Images, where I put songs from the band Sabaton over these mm. just memes I come across, or just whatever <laughs> rubbish. I remember actually looking through one of them on a stream right. I did when I was uh, looking for an image to send someone, and I remember they just went something like, is that Kanye meeting with Hitler? <laughs> As I was skimming through one of them. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I've included some what I believe would be dubbed anti-LGBTQ type stuff in there. Just memes, like one I remember including on, I think it was my latest one, of f first Pride Month celebration, and it was artwork of Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I remember someone sent that to me, no. and I was like, just give me, give me oh that now. <laughs> so yeah, um, here goes our careers. <laughs> See you on the other side. See, uh, see, I'm more of an equal opportunist kind of uh, meme where like I'll make fun of anybody at any time. So, and you know, I I feel like paleontology is a place where we're, we're studying dead animals and things that don't exist. We're having fun with it. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't get too angry or political. Uh, political and. I, I do kind of regret being a little polarizing in that sense. I don't regret my viewpoints, I just regret kind of polarizing it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, that's not a good enough apology for the mob. They'll never take that as an apology. Um, well, are they even going to continue it should be to a watch place you for like... if you apologize? You might as well oh. just not apologize. Sorry, what? I couldn't hear that. I was just saying, would they even continue to watch yeah. you if you apologize? They're not going to bother. No, 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 they wouldn't. <laughs> That's how it works. Uh, it's like, you know, it's, I do want to be a place that's kind of welcoming to all people. I don't want to change my standards or my viewpoints, but I also don't want to alienate anybody. Mm. So I, I kind of pulled back from making jokes like that. But at the same time, like, coming into my channel, <laughs> like, I've mentioned being a Christian conservative before. And so they know that's a thing about me. So it's like a take it or leave it kind of thing. Like, you're not going to force me to change how I, my views, but also I'm not here. This isn't like a, a Bible channel. I'm not here to preach to you. So, mm. so we can respect each other in that sense. The main thing I just dislike is, yeah, all the political stuff now. I mean, like, um, I've seen, uh, what's his name? Edge? <laughs> I noticed in some of his videos, he always seems to like mentioning that this or yeah. that person was a screaming racist. And I'm just sat back thinking, like, you do understand that Henry Fairfield Osborne <laughs> was raised in the sort of time where if you just randomly dropped out of nowhere, I want to kill all black people, no one would bat an eye. Right? So I don't think him being a screaming yeah. racist is, like, it, anything yeah. new. Or, like, I remember reading in Darren Nash's book, Book, Dinopedia, Brief Compendium Dawn of Sword Law. Great book, by the way, I re recommend getting it. Uh, he has a chapter in there on the Bone Wars, <laughs> and for some okay. reason, he felt the need to point out that Cope was um, a racist and sexist, and as he put it, was happy to express his views in print. And I'm set back thinking, like, you do understand that around the time Cope was alive, the Civil War was happening. So, has it matter bringing up that he was a racist? <laughs> uh, it's... Like, this it's dude grew up with slavery. What do you, you know, expect? I understand, like... Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, it's part of their time. But... Uh, I guess, like, just... We can acknowledge their accomplishments in science, or things that they got wrong, mm. without praising them personally 
Yeah. And so I guess they, you want to make that distinction that you might support... Maybe they got this idea right, or made this breakthrough, but... Hmm. That doesn't mean you support their other stuff. Well, hey, I, um... I do notice that... Well, well, um... I will also say that... Even in that time, though... There were still, like, abolitionists and people who didn't feel the need to be horrible and racist. <laughs> um, so, I'm not sure how much that I agree with the defense that it was just, like, for their time. Mm -hmm. But it was definitely more common in that time, but they yeah. still could have been better. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I, I will say, on that point, yeah, I do notice, like, I don't want to start beef with any other YouTuber. But they do have to like keep injecting like you have to be on the ultra liberal side or we're gonna we're gonna put this as a big part of our video. Uh, I think Edge did like a T Rex being Toxic toxically masculine kind of thing. I remember actually unsubscribing and for him briefly because of that. Because I was just sat back thinking like, oh, you gotta be freaking kidding me. <laughs> Like, well, I remember one of the points he made in that video. I can't remember too much of it, but I think one was something like, um, I'm trying to remember. It was something like of how, oh, a majority of paleontologists are straight white men. And I'm just sat back thinking, you do understand a large majority of the population of the United States of America and Australia and Britain are straight white men. So, of course, a majority oh, of straight, paleontologists right, yeah. are going right. to be straight white men. Not everything is equal 50-50. Like, yeah, I mean... Like, paleontology really started off in Britain and France, and yeah. there's a lot of straight white men at that time, in that place, in that time. Um... And, I mean, unfortunately, when paleontology was starting, there weren't the same opportunities for uh, women and people of color. Mm. But, um, well, I, I'm losing my train of thought here. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, like, I'm fine with other people getting involved in other types of people. I'm not particularly traditionally white. I'm, like, uh, Hispanic. I'm a lighter Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Um... But it's kind of like leftists have kind of claimed paleontology as theirs, and it's like, can't we just like all come together and enjoy paleontology? Like, we don't need to yeah, I mean, hyper politicize it or say like, if you don't agree with our views, then you're not like, then we shouldn't listen to you. You're not a real paleontologist. You should get off YouTube, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, it. it well, actually, one of the questions I had on. <laughs> This um, list was one of the specific questions was what were your political affiliations, but I think I figured that one out already <laughs> just from us talking, <laughs> because um, <laughs> I remember me and I, a, me and a mate of mine developing a he's developing a video game. I mean, not me. Um, I remember while he was showing uh -huh. me some of the features of the uh, game he's working on, a dinosaur battle royale game called The Time Forgotten. Um, I remember he. Well, him and I, we started talking of... It seems like quite a few paleonto paleontology-type channels are on the liberal side. To the point that I remember both him and I were sat back yeah. like, um, uh, oh, what about Red Raptor rights? And I remember he just went, oh, yeah, he seems like a bit of a tough nut to crack when it comes to his stuff. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I guess we now know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, no, uh... <laughs> yeah, it's... Like, you have to, like, search deep in the lore to kind of piece together where I'm at, so... And, again, it's because I wanted it to be, like, welcoming. Like, you can come from the left, the right, and enjoy dinosaurs, enjoy paleontology, enjoy my channel. And if you're too divisive, then you just cut your fan base in half. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm... I don't know exactly what the political scene is like in Australia. But it's pretty like, similar. I'm to a what, conservative Christian. It's pretty similar to what you get over in America, really, and, because um, well, just as an example, we had recently yeah. the voice to parliament referendum, which um, the idea behind it was of how, well, basically the.
big politicians were saying of how, oh, Australia, I mean, the Aboriginal Australians have been here for, like, oh, X amount of thousands of years, whatever they're claiming now, um, but they haven't been recognised yet in the Constitution, so therefore this voice to Parliament will have them be recognised. But um, the problem with that is, well, really it seems more so, like I remember one more, I guess you could call conspiracy theorist type YouTuber out there, um, I remember him pointing out and making a good argument that it seems yeah. more so like an attempt to just bring communism to Australia. And not just that, but my main argument against The Voice was that um, when you looked at it, right, they said of how they aren't recognised by the Constitution. But the thing is, is that the Australian Constitution recognises all peoples of Australia. And the Aboriginals were considered human. Sorry, it includes them. Yeah, because they ended up finally being considered human, and by extension, peoples of Australia, in 1967. So, the... Uh, Constitution of Australia does recognise the Aboriginals. Really? Like, you don't need peoples of Australia and then Aboriginals, they're just people of Australia. Yeah. We're all just lumped together in this one massive constitution. We don't need special rights for them. And not just that, but like I remember tons of people pointing out, there's a lot of Aboriginal exclusive stuff in Australia for them. Like, example, here, there's, like, six different healthcare buildings in my town alone, and they just finished building one. Their reason? Oh, because we'd need to go down to this capital city in order to get it done. White man still needs to go and go down to capital city to have it done. So, we already have the voice for So, are you them. saying it's, like, like, a segregation? It is pretty much getting to the point of I segregation. Think it's like modern segregation. Well, like I said, that well, like I remember my dad saying about it, right? You go to one of these places, they're not going to treat white men, or just anyone who's not Aboriginal. Or love one my mother told me about. Right. She was having troubles with the internet or something, so she rang up the internet service. She was sat there waiting for 15 minutes trying to get it. Then she rang the line exclusively for the Aboriginals. Not even five seconds and they had answered already. So, um... That's nice that they're there to help, but it stinks that you have literally two different services yeah. of... Just lump them together. The same service for diff both groups. Or love one. It's... I, I don't know too much about Australia. Mm. I mean... I mean, I don't know as much as an Australian, so... Mm -hmm. I mean... I don't know if my opinion would be valid or anything, but oh, it's just messed up Sorry, right I'm now. Still there. <laughs> it's just messed up. Yeah, I'm still. I'm back. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the same way. Mm. It's kind of like circling back around that it went from segregation good, which is obviously wrong, to segregation bad. Um, going back to segregation is good because because this um, time we're helping we need to celebrate people of color. We're helping the minority. We're not punishing <laughs> this them. This time it's good. Yeah, but now you're punishing the majority. <laughs> majority. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's a crap show out there. <laughs> well, I guess it before really we, is. I guess like, before we. I miss. Just... Uh, I, I miss the idea mm -hmm. of not judging people by the color of their skin. Now it comes to, you judge people by the color of their skin, whether they're an oppressor or the oppressed, and then you make the rules accordingly. Oh, a new school shooting just happened. Oh, were they trans? Okay, don't release the manifesto because it's going to have stuff saying they hate white people. Oh, were they white and straight? Okay, release the manifesto right, exactly. where it says yeah. they hate black people. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly how it works. I love like, one I saw. It was a, uh, it's, it's a darn shame. It was a shooting. Another school. Sh no, I think it was a gay bar that got shot up and shot up in Colorado, USA. And they were sat there trying to paint it as an anti-LGBTQ event and all that. All right, he was a straight supremacist. The shooter <laughs> later admitted he was non-binary. <laughs> I remember seeing 
news reporters react like, to this yeah. and you should have seen their face just drop and their eyes their eyes opened wide and shocked and they were set back like hang on we, we, <laughs> what <laughs> if they you know if they do react to it at all i mean they, a lot of them would just bury the story and not cover it yeah just quick bury 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 that they're always loud they're always allowed to jump to conclusions but when it comes time to apologize they're just uh you know it's yesterday's news we don't need to talk about it yeah everyone moves on by then to the next big event it's like with the movies where i remember seeing something i think it was some clip from like what's their name red lair media where it's like um oh get excited for new product go see new product get excited for next product <laughs> Yeah, exactly, I love that one. Get yeah. angry over... That's exactly the case. Get angry over this news event. Uh, talk about it. Get excited for next news <laughs> event. Just that on repeat. Like, it's, it's that way with, like... We've had a lot of rioting going on in the United States over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Like, whenever BLM, like, levels a city over a shooting that not all the facts were out yet and they might have their complete wrong yeah. ideas about it like the media just brushes it off as a no no it's mostly peaceful i love that one of what was and it then, fiery but mostly no, peaceful we, we get... <laughs> half the landscapes yeah. burning behind it, him it's unfortunate that <laughs> it's unfortunate that conservatives gave them january 6th because then no, nah, that's all. They've been complaining about that one for three years now. About two, almost three years now. Uh, um, so it's like, when conservatives do it, it's the talk of the town for uh, years. When the left does it, it's like, no, 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 it's always like peaceful, we're fine here. They're, they're, they're okay to do it. Didn't they, didn't they make a committee about that January 6th event? <gasps> that's, the part of, that's the part I found yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. You'd think for it being such a massive event and all that, they would have it done and over in seconds. But no, we must drag it out. Right. Why? Keep it in the news. Yes. Distract from whatever state I mean, secrets Biden like leaked just... today. <laughs> um... Yeah, I don't know how too far into the rabbit hole you want to get with politics. I don't know how how fast I want to get canceled today. Next. But um, one thing I well, I I did want to like you know kind of you come out as conservative kind of early on, so it's like you you can't really cancel some like people join maybe like already with the idea that okay he's conservative, so it's like. You're not telling me anything new. Yep. It's so like, alright. Alright. Okay, I'm ready for the next question. <laughs> okay, I sort of lost track of which one it was. So, uh, thoughts on the paleontology side of YouTube? Um, it's... It's pretty good. I, I think it's been getting better over the years. <laughs> like, I keep getting new recommendations for videos about an you know some extinct animal some extinct some dinosaur um i'm finding a lot of new new names popping up i was about to on say YouTube that. I, I that, quite uh, as well i know as well yeah quite a few different smaller what? youtube channels have popped up right like they'll make a video it gets popular and then they just shoot up like um What's his name? You had Extinct Zoo, I think it was. He got quite a few different views, and he's a pretty recent channel. Yeah. Then yeah, after Extinct Zoo. Then after that, you had um, me with my little boom in popularity. If you could even call it like a major thing. Yeah. <laughs> then I, then um, another YouTuber I came across. I think his name's the Overseer. The Raptor Chatter. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying the to think of others. I think the Overseer. Oh. He ended up getting. Um, paleoanalysis. Oh yeah, him too. I'm trying to think, what are some others? <laughs> Trailer explainer hit um, one mil. I went through my subscriptions, but um, I don't think uh, he did. Can you even still call him a paleontology channel? 
I, I haven't watched Trey in years, man. That's when I was, like, in high school. I think the last paleontology video he did Maybe was, like, he's... three years ago. I think he's moved on to stuff like archaeology. <laughs> okay, I mean, well, I hope he does okay. I, I don't know, I wish him all the best. I don't wish him any ill will. I'm waiting for I, his next cryptozoology video. I videos. feel like someone's mentioned... Yeah, I feel like someone's mentioned his channel being controversial about something, but I don't know what it is. He seems fine to me. Anyway, well, if there's something weird going on, <laughs> mm. I guess um, we'll have to wait and see with Trey. <laughs> okay. Uh, there was one channel I really liked called uh, Paleo Nerd. Mm -hmm. He did a really good play-by-play -play takedown of Jurassic Fight Club, and he started Monsters Resurrected, but never finished. I've and... seen him pop up here and there. I don't know, he, I guess he doesn't have the time to upload. I think his yeah, latest upload was like... a video once in a while, but... I think his latest upload was like six months so... ago, but I believe he put out a community post saying that he's going to be putting out something soon. I hope so, I hope so. I miss him. He was a big inspiration for me. I haven't really like, seen too I just much of him. Sitting on the couch, watching all his channels. <laughs> um, and there's some other great channels that are still around. Like even though Edge does get political sometimes, like I I do like Edge or when he's talking about dinosaurs and paleontology. Not um, political. Crap. No, I wish them no ill will. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind watching Edge. He, he seems um, to do his research. He does. He like he's really good at taking very complex subjects and kind of making them into consumable bits, easy to understand. Yeah. Like he's good at breaking down content, so I don't have to like go and read an entire journal article. Hmm. I can watch an Edge video and get the gist of it. Yeah, I do that as well. Like, I remember um, getting his video that popped up on, uh, I think it was the T-Rex species, back when Gregory Paul submitted that idea of splitting T-Rex into three species. Yeah, I remember just uh, deciding to watch Edge's video on it. And found that interesting to watch. Yeah. One of the things I actually found interesting was... I really um, like, um... Oh, yeah. You know that Princeton Field, to Field Guide to Dinosaurs I mentioned earlier? Um... Gregory Paul in there, he oh, yeah. he sort of Gregory played Paul. he played around with his own sort of taxonomy of dinosaurs in there, right? As an example, Giganosaurus is lumped in as a species of Carcharodontosaurus, so he has it listed in the book as Giganosaurus <laughs> or Carcharodontosaurus carolini. Um, but another one he's done in that book was he lumped in I think it was Nanooksaurus, Tarbosaurus, and a what was it called? Uh, Teratophonus? Phonius? I think it's something like that. Teratophonius. He lumped those three in as species of T-Rex, or Tyrannosaurus species, and mm. then he split T-Rex into three different species. So you had T-Rex, unnamed robust species, and then unnamed gracile species. So he actually had the idea of splitting T-Rex into three separate species for longer than most think. That's... I, I know that Paul has like a reputation of being a lumper, mm -hmm. but I did not know he like went that far, like <laughs> down, down, that far down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I um, found that weird. I remember reading through that book once, I think it was on the same day I got it, my birthday, and I was skimming through it, and when I came across that, because I heard of his taxonomy in that book, and, um, well, I only heard that for the original edition, I have the second edition, so I decided to go through and check it all, and see if anything changed, and I remember as soon as I opened it up and saw the thing of the, uh, three different, sp of the unnamed robust and grassile species of Tyrannosaurus in there, I remember just going to myself, he had this idea longer than I thought. <laughs> Because I think the original edition came out in right. 2010. The second edition, which is what I have, is from 2016. So, uh, yeah, he had it a that's, lot longer. It's really interesting that he puts that as, uh, yeah, he puts them as different species. Because I remember <laughs> growing up, I don't think this is still the case today, but I remember growing up, it was like, 
oh, the robust one is the female, the grass on one is the male, and then... Mm. Uh, well, at least that's, that's what they were saying. But he put it as different species. I don't know where that's at. I Maybe, like, individual variation now or something? I think I saw something saying it's believed they might be, uh, like, two different forms of the same species. Like, not species in of themselves or subspecies, just two different morphs. Like, you know, how you have some humans that'll be really tall and skinny, and then others that might be the same height, but just robust as. <laughs> so Yeah, robust. Let's say robust. Yeah, individual variation. Yeah. <laughs> then you Yeah, so you have the bean pole that. and I can the see that making sense. Or um another thing I think I saw was uh growth stages. Huh. Like, that really robust one is the final form. <laughs> it's not even his final form. But... And then... Yeah, I... Yeah, then we They have... would have to, like, chart, like, length, mm -hmm. size to... Yeah. Robustness. And if you could see a graph showing that the older ones are more robust, then... Yeah. I think that makes sense. It reminds me of, I think it was one of the points. Um, I remember Edge went over quite a few different comments different paleontologists had about Paul's paper on splitting T-Rex up, and I think one of the things that quite a few said was, um, we gotta see where the fossils are from uh, in order to see if there is any sort of, like, species thing, and not just that, but the time as well. So, uh, that makes it a bit more interesting. I heard it's it's been a while. I don't remember exactly, but I heard like the traits weren't that consistent across uh, specimens. <laughs> like you can't really neatly organize them into three. Yeah, I think I read something saying um that even when they were writing the paper, they had problems trying to decide which one goes in each species, and um Philip Curry of the That's university. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe it was Philip Curry, uh, he was uh, writing the paper as well as everyone else, but he later dropped out because he felt like the evidence wasn't good. He didn't believe there was any at all. Yeah. <laughs> if, I mean, if you're having trouble categorizing them and can't tell which one goes where, then maybe, just maybe, they aren't separate species or separate along the lines that you think they are. Well, for me, it's like when you have someone as uh, credible and as respected as Phil Curry hopping on your paper and then jumping off before it can be published, <laughs> what does that say? It's going down. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I remember reading something in one of my books right. where they said oh. of how Phil Curry is up there in like the top three for one of the best paleontologists in North America. So yeah, you know. It's... I mean, I see his name on a lot of AirPod stuff. So yeah, I remember watching. Definitely, I can agree with that. I remember watching something where they said apparently he's one of like the last great dinosaur generalists out there because he's done everything. He's covered every clade. <laughs> he's collected them all. Pokemon. You gotta catch them all. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple books from him. I think. It's Do you have a favorite paleontologist? Uh, not really. Just, I guess the best way you could put favorite is which ones I reference the most. And so far, I'd probably say that's been mm -hmm. Darren Nash with his books. Alongside, uh... He's up there. He's up there. Alongside, uh, Donald Glutt, who I don't think is an actual paleontologist. I don't think he has any degrees or anything. But, um, well, his main thing has just been writing, like, novelizations of Star Wars films. But he also has a series of encyclopedias. I have them right next to me, <laughs> called uh, Dinosaurs the Encyclopedia. And uh, if I remember correctly, the first one was published in 1997, and there were also seven supplemental volumes, all the way up until mm. 2012. They were republished uh, last year, I think, all of them. Uh, and they're pretty good overall. I think Gregory Paul and... I haven't seen any of his work. Princeton Field Guide to Dinosaurs. I think they recommend his work in there. I'll send you the cover of it. Dinosaurs, the in isn't isn't that where he lumped Deinonychus into Velociraptor? 
Uh, no, I think that was Paul. Oh, which book was that? Oh, uh, was it Predatory Dinosaurs of the World? Ah, uh, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the. Uh, well, this is just. I don't think he had any justification like, for that one. They look. <laughs> it would be cool, okay. <laughs> yeah, he's just like, uh, guys, yeah, hear me out. Different skulls and from different time, completely different times and places, totally different morphologies. Uh, you know, it'd be cool. <laughs> we can make a movie about this. Yes, then, oh yeah, that's how the Jurassic Park Raptors came to be. I remember even seeing concept art of the Jurassic Park Raptors, and I remember the person who showed it to me, I just went to him, that looks a lot like Backer's Dionicus reconstruction. You know the one, the shrink-wrapped right, lizard right. thing? <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> that monstrosity. Um, Accurate like, for its time, though. <laughs> yeah, it just, yeah. What the, the, it was revolutionary for its time, but we could move on. Which Yes, move on, I, I wish that was the consensus of Jurassic Park, but so many people keep, like, clinging on. Like, that's all they know of dinosaurs. That's the, that's the thing I find sort of sad about it. Like, it reminds me of with the latest Transformers uh -huh. film to come out, Transformers Rise of the Beasts, I ended up going and seeing that uh, when it came out where I live. And, um, well, I remember quite a few people on YouTube and all that were saying, this is the Transformers film we always um, needed and all that. And I remember watching it, and they race-swapped a Transformer. Uh and I'm, I'm just being How do you serious. race swap a transformer? Exactly, a transformer. That's, that's what I was thinking throughout the film. And I was just sat back thinking, like, what even is this movie? <laughs> like, I love some of the comments where they just completely <laughs> contradict the Wait, film. Wait, but honestly, how... <laughs> just some of the comments, like, sort of completely contradict how, how did it. they race swap a transformer? I think the character's name is Wheeljack. Right? Now, in the original film, or original uh, series, hang on, I'll look... Wheel... Jack G1, right. I believe it is. It sounds familiar. I've only seen, like, the first a couple episodes of the first two seasons. Most I've seen is the Michael Bay films, this and one, I Bumblebee. Saw the movie. And, uh, right, so there you go. There's the original Wheel Jack. Right now, what do I put in? Uh, Rise of the Beast. Uh, hang on. I guess I guess we're going back into politics. <laughs> yeah, but, but I just uh, thought this would be fun to keeps point doing. out. Like, if... That's the change up. Uh, and not just that, but they also gave him a Peruvian accent in the film. They race swapped an alien that's robot. How they made him like Latino. <laughs> yeah, they race swapped an alien robot. <laughs> <laughs> but why? Like. Here's my my take. Like, you know, it's fine if you want to like have new voices and film and ha you know show new people. That's that's fine. That's cool. Can you at but least don't like take pre-existing characters and just like they're gay now or they're black now, so new <laughs> they're better. Great. What's next, Black Optimus Prime? Like, just, just make a new character, a new story. Black. <laughs> you can imagine that now already. He's gonna defeat Megatron by saying the N word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't Prime. say that. <laughs> You're not black. Well, little did you know, Megatron. <laughs> I'm not black. <laughs> no, he got an N word no, pass. Like... <laughs> I can imagine that already oh, now. No, he got it from Cybertron. <laughs> <laughs> With the power of the primes, I shall right, say. Ni <laughs> All right, next one. All right, we've got our check. Things, All right, next question. Things that annoy you about paleontology or the community surrounding it. Oh, I think we've kind of already covered that. That it yep. feels the need to be politically polarized. You need to join their camp, or else. Yeah. You're cancelled, you're booted off. Oh, we don't so, like you anymore. So and so said Sorofaganax is a valid genius, but he's a bad person because he voted for Trump. <laughs> so therefore, Sorofaganax exactly. isn't valid. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess move on to the like, next one. Again, yeah. We can, we can have. Um, 
Wait, uh, I there are a few other minor things. It's kind of like I feel like the community can tend to idolize certain things, like the Jurassic World movie. Get those movies get idolized despite having many flaws. And if you point out those flaws, you get screeched at. Mm. Um, and same thing with Prehistoric Planet. Like, I thought it was a great documentary overall, but there were a few points that I criticized. And it's like, whenever you criticize it, there's always like people who have to, like, they sworn their lives to defend it. I can't take any criticism of it. Like, it has to be perfect. It's perfect in my mind. You can't criticize it. Uh, I think we kind of have to, like, tear down these idols. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to, like, science and accuracy. Because yeah. if, like, there's a scientific problem with it, then there's a scientific problem with it. Then it's not accurate. Uh, uh, my problems with Jurassic World are in accuracy. But they, I just think they're bad movies. But it's like, they have these, uh, like, what is it golden cows? Is that <laughs> is that the phrase? I think one of my main problems is like sometimes I've gone into debates like on comments in YouTube videos and stuff, or on Discord, and I might reference a source, <laughs> and the only argument it seems like anyone can ever come up with is, oh, it was published in this year, so therefore it's outdated. Like, I don't know about you, but 2019's pretty right. recent for a book. And um, not just that, but what source do you That's have... That's very recent. <laughs> what sort of source do you have to back up that claim? Like, do you have a scientific paper you can go... So, so instead of just going, oh, what you're referencing is outdated because it's from 1997, how about you go, oh, there was this paper from 2015 that showed that Sorophaganax wasn't valid or whatever. Right? Rather than just going, oh, it's from this year, it's outdated. Right. It, exactly. Something like that. Like, there's there's certain right, yeah, arguments... That's a perfect example. Well, there's I'll certain take... arguments that just don't work. That's one of them. Just, oh, it's from this year, it's outdated. <laughs> I mean, you might have a point... If yeah, we're... I can see that. That's, you... That'd be annoying. You might have a point when we're talking books from, like, I don't know, the 1950s on whether or not dinosaurs were cold-blooded or not. But it doesn't work all the time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, like, unless there's been mm -hmm. something else to overthrow that idea or come up with a new explanation. Yeah. And, like, like convincingly, like, like it's not really a debate anymore. There's a new idea in place, and you can reference this paper that says, all right, this is it now. Well, one thing I like is... Yeah, uh, just don't just say, you're bad. Yeah. Well, one thing I like is of how, right, the... So they're going, oh, it's from this year, it's outdated. But the thing I find funny is paleontologists like Darren Nash in his 2023 book, uh, Ancient Sea Reptiles, if I remember correctly, in there, one book he recommended as further information was uh, from 1992, Dinosaurs, Spitfires, and Sea Dragons by Christopher McGowan. And I'm just sat back thinking, like, okay, if anything from that year is old and outdated, then why is he recommending it in 2023? 30 years later. <laughs> oh, we... Admittedly, like, it is good to state... We still have to go back and give them credit. Like, they had yeah. some ideas back then, some good ideas. I mean, I will admit, it is still the case of, like, filter right. through to see what is outdated, obviously. But nothing is going to be 100% right. out of date just because it's from, oh, this year. And not just that, but I think it should right. also be yeah, pointed exactly. out that... Well, I remember someone else also went to me like, oh, I have this book that's only a few months old. I just got it today or whatever. And I'm just sat back thinking like, you do understand that the <laughs> publishing, right? These books take a few months in order to have been like, go for a printing run, edited, all that, advertised. So by the time the book comes out, there's going to be several things out of date that you might not be aware of. But no, you blindly follow it because, oh, oh, oh it's Any published this year. <laughs> Anything involving Spinosaurus. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> just, just throw it out. <laughs> Alrighty, next There's always one. a new paper. <laughs> uh, any other interests besides paleontology? Um, yes. Well, <laughs> interests... Like, his history is like my job, I teach it, so I don't know how much of an interest that is. 
Um, I like history, but like more modern history, like <laughs> industrial and forward. I don't really <laughs> care that much about ancient history. <laughs> um, it's fun for some people, it's just not for me. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I like filmmaking, movies, I think I've covered that already. Mm -hmm. um, I think you said you were a Five yeah. Nights at Freddy's fan uh, at one point in the video. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm a, I've always been a big fan of Five Nights at Freddy's. I haven't, uh, I haven't seen I your it's... review of the film yet. I haven't even seen the film yet. <laughs> It's a very divisive movie. Some fans love it, some fans hate it. I can see why, it's not for everyone. But I I found a lot of enjoyment out of it, and I think, not great, but a solid, worthwhile movie. From what I've heard, it sounds like most of the people, or um, well, it sounds like most of it is just like fan appeal and all that. Honestly, it... There, there are some things that it references. It could have been a lot worse, where it's just like... It could have been reference, reference, reference the movie, but it does build its own story. Mm -hmm. And, like, tells its own... Like, it has its own interesting characters that you get involved with. So, I think it holds up as its own as a movie. Mm -hmm. And... That it, it... You cannot be a fan at all and go see it and have a good time. Kind of reminds but, uh, me of... Yeah, uh... that's... Uh, that just started making me think of Godzilla King of the Monsters because that film seemed like a bit of a Godzilla tribute film when you think about it <laughs> honestly I, I saw it once and I remember nothing about it but it just came and went oh I remember there just being so many like different references like um the monarch bases they had around the world monitoring all the kaiju if I remember correctly each one also ref each one were numbered, so if I remember correctly, the one that had Ghidorah, that was numbered, I think, as uh, Monarch Base 33, which was the year that King Kong, the original film, came out. Then I think Rodan, uh, his base was labelled as 56, the year his film came out. Mothra, hers was labelled 61, the year her film came out. All right, so it was just on and on and on and on. You look, the more and more these just... Uh, they're all references to the different films. And there was some well, others throughout I mean, the film. This... Yeah. Like, uh, I think... I mean, as long as the fan service doesn't get in the way of, like, the plot or the cat, Like, you don't... <laughs> you don't ruin the film with... You don't rely too much on fan service to carry your movie. That's what, like, a lot of these Disney remakes do. It's like... Oh, well, they already like the original, so we'll just have this nostalgic bit, and... Well, we just assume you know all the characters already and don't need any more investing in them, so why bother establishing them, you know? I remember just being so sat... as long as they'll get like that... Yeah. I remember just being sat back, like, um... I, like a... I remember with, I think it was the Lion oh. King remake. I remember the other day someone asked me about it, <laughs> like, have I seen it or anything? And I remember when I replied, no, they went, hang on, you haven't seen it? And I remember just being set back, like, I remember seeing the original Lion King a couple times, like, over a decade ago. And if it's the same movie, I'm not going to bother seeing it. It's it's not the same movie. It's just a much worse version of the original. Because they don't try. They feel like the audience already loves it, so why try? And it's so infuriating. But it's no. like, they just expect the emotions to already be there for, for each scene, so they put no effort into building up each scene, like like it used to be. Why aren't you crying at Mufasa's death, you little consumer? Basically, the, exactly. basically the entire exactly. film. Like, 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 they suck out all the emotion from that relationship and expect you to have the same reaction because, hey, it's the original. Um... One good example that my sister pointed out as what well, actually my sister Bethany she makes some guest appearances sometimes, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> um, in the Aladdin remake he asks Jasmine, "Do you trust me?" And then the movie literally pauses to play like this majestic music when he said, "Do you trust me?" But this is just the first time he's saying it in the movie, and it doesn't mean anything yet. But they try to 
like have this magical moment because you remember it from the original. Oh, so, so yeah, uh, film is another thing I really like. Okay, and this is and, one I just sort of add uh, as a joke for just okay. all the people. Uh, any video requests for me to make? For you to make? Yeah. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure how much you've got done. My main oh, claim. Let me to, see. If I'm incorrectly, my main claim to fame is that I was the first to do a dedicated video on Alamosaurus. That's my main claim to fame. <laughs> That's cool. All right, I see it here in your videos. Um. Hmm. Maybe you have a lot on big cats. And you seem to like cats, so maybe something on like the American lion or the cave lion. I remember actually, um, there's this one guy who subscribed to me, his name's Tyrannotherium. If I'm currently with some other people I talk with here and there, he's sort of, um, he's considered to be a bit weird. Oh, I feel Look, like I recognize that name. Uh, just as an example, uh, you know that new T-Rex specimen, Cope? The one that's bigger than Scotty? Um, he reckons it's fake. Yes, I heard about it. He reckons it's fake. He reckons it's rubbish. <laughs> a hoax. Because according to him, T-Rex can only get to 10 tons. Which, um, I find a little silly. <laughs> because, well, like I remember, well, we said they're saying, oh, it's only just a femur. Where's the rest of the skeleton? But, like I remember one of my mates pointed out to me, um, the femur is probably the best part of the animal to use for estimating weight. If you're going to use any bone to estimate the weight. It is. It's usually the one that... That use, yeah. So if the estimation from the femur oh, says, it's like, yeah. says it's like 11 to 10 tons, maybe it is, I mean, not 11 to 10, 11 to 12 tons, then maybe it is 11 to 12 tons. But yeah, um, I remember getting into another sort of, uh, well, he made a video told something like um, debunking the 500 pound American lion myth, because he was, well, apparently he's seen a lot of people saying American lions were only 500 pounds. And he was saying of how, oh, that's too small. That's more like a sub-adult male or female. A male would be like seven to 800, 900 pounds. And I remember one of the arguments he went with in that video was something like, um, he went something like, oh, let's do the math. African lions are 400 to 500 pounds on average for males. American lions are 25% larger. So that means your average American male lion would be 700 to 800 pounds. To which um, I then did a response to his video where I went, okay, let's do the math with a calculator. And I just went 700 to 800. Uh, no, what we're actually looking at is 500 huh. to 625 pounds is the average weight of a male American lion. And I remember he ended up doing a. Oh, uh, yeah. It does scaling. Yeah. is difficult. It's difficult to do in terms. Like I know they have all these algorithms to figure out the size of things. It's difficult. The yeah, um, he did the response video, um, uh, saying um that he is not that great at math. But um, personally for me, it's like really, at least this is the way I see it. If you're gonna, well, one of the things he explained in his response to my response was of how. He got it from some, like, podcast or something he watched where they said that you get American lions the size of Kodiak bears. And really, for me, it's like, if you're going to do a video where it's told something like debunking this certain myth, you want a little bit more in the way of research than just, um, than just going off of what some random expert or supposed expert said in a YouTube video. Like, um... Right, right, that's true. Well, uh, I did a video... You have to do your, like... Go back to the sources themselves, not just... Do actual research, yeah. I mean... Like, shut... Right, yeah. With this one... I did a video on, um... The Amer the Australian big cats... With a uh, one idea behind it... That they came here because US airmen dumped them in the bush. Um, like, they were told to destroy them... But they were too attached... So they just let them go in the bush. And now they've bred up... And they've spread across the entire continent. And I did a video debunking that. And, um... Huh. The thing is, is that I didn't just, like, I, w I didn't just go, like, oh, I read this thing of an interview with Dr. Carl Schuker, a British cryptozoologist. I actually referenced, um, 
uh, two highly critically acclaimed books on the subject in the form of Mystery Cats of the World by cryptozoologist Carl Schuker and Australian Big Cats and the Natural History of Panthers by uh, Rebe Rebe Rebecca Lang and Michael Williams. So for me, it's like, well, who do you think's done a lot of research there? Because, like I said, I've decided to look at the sources of two of the most critically acclaimed books on the subject of cats and cryptozoology. Heck, Williams and Lang's book is... Right, <laughs> right. Williams and Lang's put in your hours. book is, if I remember correctly, considered to be the best work on Australian big cats. I remember even Naish said it's the best book on the subject. So, for me, it's like, if that says that maybe yeah, like that maybe Black Panthers weren't brought here by US Airmen, they're not here from because of US Airmen. Right, like, that's why it's, like, so important to have those sources in there. So, mm. like, don't just take my word for it. Look at this, um, you know, look at the research. Look where I got this information from, and, you know, you could... See for yourself if you're trying to prove me wrong here. Yeah, like if bloody you want to, I don't know, say do a video on that thing I said earlier of maybe Philaka Leo might still live or might not. Like actually do research into it. Like read Williams and Lang's book on Australian big cats. Not just go, oh, Calvin the Carnotaurus said on the right. podcast right. I did with him that uh, it's not alive. <laughs> because as I said, that's just my opinion. <laughs> Right, and I don't. Well, I don't have any degree in like paleontology or biology or geology, so I'm not like the doctor to cite that source from. Look at the people I got the information from, not just me. I remember actually referencing. Uh, quite... Do you plan on going into like? Huh? Yeah. What? Do you, Do you plan on going into paleontology? I'm not sure. Right like for now. a career. I'm not sure right now. I'm just sticking with YouTube for now. <laughs> but uh, with what? Uh, just with YouTube for now. But we'll see how it goes. Oh. Uh, okay. I mean, for me, it's, yes. See, <laughs> I guess it uh, is well, sort of me just sticking with yeah. paleontology because I am, you know, doing paleontology videos. <laughs> Making sure you're already do, good at it. Yeah, do <laughs> might research as well. and everything. I mean, like um. With some of the books I've mentioned throughout oh. this little podcast, um, I've even gone as far as making sure to list off all the page numbers I've read as well from each book. Like, if you just click on my Alamosaurus video and scroll down, you'll see all the sources I used, and you'll see I even listed off the sources in the form of the pages of each book I used. So that way you can actually more thoroughly check Dang. my work. Right? That's because, thorough. Yeah. <laughs> Because, well, uh, think about it, right? That's awesome. No one's going to read a 700-page book to fact-check someone. Right? <laughs> You'd read 10 pages yeah, from that yeah. book and then get bored. Are they also going to go... <laughs> so, yeah, that's... Are they also gonna, just going to spend money on Amazon to buy a book just to fact-check someone? That... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a lot. Hmm. I mean, quite a few uh, of the books yeah, I like, use... Typically, I, you know... Yeah. Like, I, I still, because I'm not that much of a reader, so I'll, I'll be citing like journals and articles rather than actual books. Like, that's legit right there. You put in the effort and the research into that. I have a bit of an addiction for books. I remember even bloody, <laughs> I was building up a Christmas wish list of all the books I want for Christmas this year, and I remember this mate of mine, Gecko, the dude developing the game I told you about earlier, I remember he went, I remember he went something like, I swear if you buy another $300 book rather than a GPU for your computer, <laughs> <laughs> so that just made me laugh, all I did was send him a cover of a book I found. <laughs> Actually no, I think I sent him a title of a book I found which glitched so it said on Amazon it was published in the year 2065 bro no wonder why it's $300 <laughs> you're literally paying an author to write it in the future oh, I love one I came across a book it's pretty from, epic 
a book from 2014 by line expert Craig Packer. I think it's told something like Man Eaters, Guns and Men or something like that. And it's about lions. And I remember I came across a copy (laughs) on, I think it was Amazon, and it glitched and it said it was published in the year 1844. Because, you know... (laughs) I mean, I know Craig Packer's an old dude. He's like 70-something, but he's not old enough to have seen the Civil War for crying out loud. (laughs) Dang. (laughs) Now that's... You're getting your hands on, like, the ancient texts. The ancient... The sacred texts of paleontology and zoology. The ancient literary work from the 1800s. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Let's see what Sir Richard Owen had to say on whether or not dinosaurs were warm blood or not. (laughs) Right. They were still alive at that point. (laughs) Those were the OG paleontologists. I love that one. Some of them still left. I love that one. What was it? Scrotum Humanum? That thing? Scrotum Humanum. The the first name given to a dinosaur I remember, scrotum wonderful i remember actually putting out a poll once asking if i were to write a book on dinosaurs would you buy it and if i remember correctly 11 percent said no you're not a paleontologist uh 60 something percent said i'd buy it as long as it's thoroughly researched and then i think uh, i think it was something <laughs> like 26 percent said write a book on scrotum humanum <laughs> and I remember even getting a comment saying, come on, I mean, Calvin, uh, we need that yeah. book. We need it. I need the scrotum book. I was even thinking of just making a oh, massive man, I piss... I need the that's... I remember even thinking of making a massive piss take, tell it something like, scrotum, the greatest book in paleontological history, and have, like, something in clo- quotation marks there, like, <laughs> an American classic. <laughs> <laughs> As you just have this bone scrotum, there that looks like a nut sack. For. <laughs> the scrotum we all want. <laughs> the scrotum we have been waiting so, for. I'm gonna have that on the book now. <laughs> <laughs> just embrace the scrotum, it's amazing. I love some of the stuff you find on there. I love a book I came across on there from David Troll. 328 pages of the n-word over and over again the funny part is oh my god (laughs) amazon listed the page count as only like 280 something where's the other pages (laughs) i really really needed to see how that book ended (laughs) just (laughs) They, they leave you on a cliffhanger (laughs) <laughs> where's the other 40 some, where's the other 48 pages of him saying the n-word <laughs> oh man I needed that uh, my life is ruined I got, I got ripped off oh, wait, so um right. <laughs> here's the final question I had I remember struggling when it comes to like specific questions okay. I had to ask you so the first one was your political affiliations, mm-hmm. but I think we have that one worked out. So here's the only one left. Okay. Um, considering your YouTube name is Red Raptor Writes, was it in any way inspired by Robert Backer's 1995 novel, Raptor Red? Oh, um... Uh... No. <laughs> I just like the alliteration, and I guess Backer did too. <laughs> I like the color scheme of red and black and i thought it sounded cool so red and black looks awesome i've heard of it i haven't read it yeah i heard about it as well but i never have read it at all the only um paleontological type works i've read is uh uh the two jurassic park books carno saw by harry adam knight the megalodon book series by steve alton and the first book in the chronos rising series by max hawthorne and all i have to say oh and uh, The Lost World by, oh, Sir Arthur, nice. by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Also read that as well. Um, and then everything else isn't really that notable. For me, I mean, I don't read a lot. <laughs> I don't read a lot unless it's like a scientific paper. So I'm out of like... Unless it's easily findable online. <laughs> um, hmm. I, I never really liked The Lost World book. Hmm. I don't know. I, I 
tried to read it twice. I got pretty far into it. I can never finish it. I I don't know what it is. Uh, all I have to say, uh, when honestly, it... I like both movies more than. Mm -hmm. uh, I like both movies more than both books. I, I read the first book entirely. Uh, what did what you say? Well, I was just gonna say with um all the paleo fiction books I've read, all I have to say is stay away from Max Hawthorne because um. Well, I said to someone the other day that I'm surprised I haven't used that book as kindling yet. Yet. <laughs> Why? What's wrong with it? I don't know. It was just so boring to read. Like, this dude's hyped up or hyped Ugh. himself up as the Prince of Paleo Fiction. No shit. When you actually look him up, that's the first thing it says. <laughs> Prince of Paleo Fiction. And I remember reading through it and I'm just oh sat back God. thinking, like, what the fuck is this? The best way to put it is a mixture between Jaws and the Meg. Like, one of the things that... Now, that sounds like something I might want to read, but I guess you didn't do it right. One of the things I found weird, right, the main character of the book, he has this thing where, um, if I remember correctly, he grew up in a very abusive household, and his dad and mom left him when he was not even a teenager, right? So... He has this thing where he has a disdain okay. for domestic huh. violence, and that later is what causes a bit of a rivalry between him and this other character later on in the book when they're hunting the main monster of the story, a Pliosaur, a Kronosaurus, I think it is actually. Right? But the thing is, is huh. that there's this scene right. huh. early on in like the first act of the book where this one character comes to him saying, hey, can you check out my lobster pots for me, because I can't. And the dude, go uh, the main hero, just goes to him, no, I can't, because uh, this, that, whatever. And then the dude tries to bribe him. Uh, and our main hero of the story is a cop, right? So he goes, oh, you're trying to bri bribe a policeman, are you? Do you really want me to let out a certain secret about you? And what he's referring to there is apparently this other character beats his wife and all I'm sat back thinking is oh my gosh all I'm just sat back thinking with that is if he has such a disdain for domestic violence why wouldn't he you know just arrest this dude on the spot because now you can get him for both domestic violence and trying to bribe a cop but no right right just no just use that as personal leverage why don't you what, what for exactly? All we've done is just yeah. scared the dude off. He's probably going to go and beat his wife more now because of that. <laughs> or I love another thing from Hawthorne. That sounds like an odd uh, choice to make for your book. Yeah. Well, then the other thing is with Max Hawthorne, yeah. because he's supposedly done all this research for his book, so now he's claiming to be some expert on paleontology. He's made the claim, and I'll see if I can send you this layer because I found it on Reddit. He made the claim that Prognathodon is the largest... Does he have any, like... No, he has no degrees as far as I know. Um, but he made the claim oh, right. on his Facebook group that Prognathodon is the largest mosasaur, weighing in at 76 uh, US tons and being roughly 80 feet long. 76? That's insane. <laughs> What's his claim to this? He supposedly has fossils in his collection indicating that Prognathicon could get to that size. And all I'm sat back thinking is that... That is... I remember watching one of your Paleo Myths videos, where I think it was the one on Pachycephalosaurus, uh, and could it possibly be like lumped together with uh -huh. Stigmalock and all that? And I think you said somewhere in there that uh, Backer, <laughs> Backer's claim to have seen him, but apparently that's his whole stick most of the time when it comes to arguments of how, oh, I've seen right. fossils, but he's never, like, ever showed them off. Like, I've seen fossils proving this or yeah. that. And really, I don't think he's... Yeah. I don't think Hawthorne's ever shown off these fossils claiming Prognathodon is, like, 80 feet long. Uh, and alongside that, he's also made claims... don't exist. I probably really misinterpret. Well, they reckon... I remember yeah, it's probably reading really something. Misinterpreting something if he has anything. I remember reading in it's the book Oceans of oh, well, Kansas yeah, by uh -huh. Michael Everhart. He has a chapter on there on mosasaurs, 
And if I remember correctly, he said in there that he reckons the largest any Mosasaur could get was about 20 meters long, which is about 65 feet. So you mean to tell me that Prognathodon is going to get like 15 feet larger? And not just that, but as far as I know, largest. as far as I know, that part of Everhart's book is actually outdated because I've come across some stuff online here and there saying that the actual largest you could expect for the larger Mosasaurs like Tylosaurus and Mosasaurus seems to be more so between like 12 to 14 meters, right. which that's like what? 40, 45 yeah, feet? Yeah, you would never... Yeah, yeah. Nothing like over 50 feet for sure, at least not that I've seen or read about. Yeah, so, um, overall... That's just scary. <laughs> Hawth Hawthorne is making some massive claims there to have supposed evidence of a Mosasaur twice the size of what's currently accepted as uh, the larger sizes of them. Oh, and if you thought that was... I might make for an interesting movie or book, but not, like, real life. Yeah. And if you think that was, uh, like, the peak of Hawthorne and his claims, he's also made claims that there is fossil evidence uh. of pliosaurs over 25 meters, like the Liopleurodon from Walking with Dinosaurs. And he's also made the claim oh my goodness. that adult megalodons were scavengers. Dedicated scavengers. Sca Jack Horner moment. Scavenger stuff. <laughs> Jack Horner moment. If something's an apex predator... It Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why? How come everything that's an Apex Predator needs to be like, oh, it's a scavenger instead? No. Who knows? Maybe you should do a come video on. responding this is to ridiculous. him. ridiculous. Maybe you should do a video doing that, responding to him. Was Megalodon a scavenger? <laughs> I haven't seen any of his work myself, but it would be I'll worth looking into, kind of debunking some of these things. But at least just analysing him, because who knows, uh, right? He might have some points here and there, who knows, maybe? But it's like, dude, uh, come on. Some things are ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, definitely, when I was researching the... From my paleo myth, whether Megalodon's still alive, I definitely came across, like... Uh, whale bones that were bitten but healed over, showing that they lived and survived the encounter, mm -hmm. which obviously you cannot do if Megalodon is just a scavenger. Yeah. If I remember correctly, his main claim when it comes to that, I remember watching the video he did on it. I'll see if I can send it, send it to you later, because he did something like a thirty or forty minute long huh. video explaining his argument for Megalodon being a scavenger. But he added at the end that he's saying this only applies for the, like, really old adult megalodons, and that the juveniles, the sub-adults, would be actual hunters. So, I guess maybe he could make the argument that those healed whale bones are actually from attacks by juvenile megs. But even then, for me, it's like, mm, really? Yeah, it sounds far-fetched. Yeah. I mean, that's something that large can't just wait around for something to die. You have to make things die if you want to eat enough. Yeah, so really out of anything, you'll just roll over and die by the time it gets to whatever age he's claiming. I mean, who knows? Maybe by yeah. that time they reach yeah, exactly. that size. Maybe their metabolism slowed down or something. But it's like, do we see this in modern sharks at all? Question mark. Yeah, no. No. <laughs> oh, it's not that I've seen or read about. I remember actually thinking of reaching out to... Uh, absolutely not. I remember even thinking of reaching out to a YouTuber by the name of Shark Bites. He's a shark scientist from, I think, the University of Exeter. And I remember just thinking of sending the video to him, going, could you do a video responding to this and see if he's got a point. Hmm. Oh, so. That would be interesting to look into more, but it doesn't sound like there's any real justification. Like, I've never heard of that before. Really? I think the best takeaway from watching that video was um, a feeding technique he reckoned Megalodon might have had, which I found a little interesting. Like I said, I'll send you the vid uh, so you can check it out, but it was what I believe he dubbed the log splitter technique, where he reckoned that what would happen is with the whale's rib cage, he reckons that the... Uh, teeth would be inserted between the ribs and they would uh, the combined pressure from all the teeth uh, splitting between uh, going in between the ribs would crack them 
So I found that a little interesting, but it's also like, how true could that be? Not just that, but think about it. Whale bones can be pretty strong, can't they? There's unarmored parts of the whale. Right, and that would be like, very hard to aim perfectly. So yeah. That would be difficult to pull off and aim perfectly every time. Maybe we got lucky. I actually made a Discord server recently. Um, because there's this one server I used to be in. It was called something like Paleontology and Animal Enjoyer Corporation or something. Peck for short. But it got deleted. Then it was restarted as Paleontology uh -huh. and Zoology Enjoyer Corporation. Pezak. Pezak. But that was deleted as well. Uh, by the same person who made the original. Pezak. By the original Peck. So what I did was I actually created my own. And I've named it Peck. The Research Institute. And one of the rules I actually have on there is no David Peters or Max Hawthorne sources unless required for a video, such as debunking them or seeing if they have a fair argument. <laughs> <laughs> just because, like... How do you get so out of hand that people just need to... It's like, stop it, just stop it, you're done. <laughs> Well of, one, <laughs> well, of one thing I got sent, it was from David Peters, you know him, the reptile evolution guy. Um, he he posted an article... David Peters. He, if I remember correctly, he believes... Um, Maybe not. It might ring a bell. I think Nash did a post on him on Tetrapod Zoology, but apparently he's a bit of a loony. He used to be a bit of a good paleo artist, but now he believes um, <sighs> like everything is... some. Um, I'm not sure how to describe it. I think I saw something saying he believes that pterosaurs belong in Lepidosauria rather than being close to dinosauria. I know they're not dinosaurs themselves, just closely related. Right. Them. Just close. Yeah. But no, he believes them to be, be in weird. Lepidosauria. I which I think is like lizards, snakes, stuff like that. Mosasaurs. But um, he made a post on his blog... Oh. The pterosaur heresy. He's claiming that Homotherium, the cat, is a canine. Right, okay. Uh, that, uh, uh. <laughs> I remember, uh, I remember, like, talking uh, with someone because they sent me this article at random and I didn't know who it was from, right? Because it was just a screenshot of the article and I sat back, like, well, I remember hearing something saying uh, Homotherium could run long distances and. That's more so like dogs. Dogs do that. But then, like I'm saying, how hard would that be for a cat to evolve that sort of running ability? And then I went searching around for the article as we were talking, and I went, oh, it's from David Peters. Never mind. <laughs> Just ignore it entirely. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Oh. Ah, the go. loony. <laughs> that explains it. So this is the product from his latest <laughs> hit of cocaine. <laughs> I wonder if people actually do that. Take a hit and then see what kind of nonsense you can come up with. Next me, he look. Next me, he pulls up his blog the next day. What the fuck did I write? <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine. Ah, uh, yeah. Look, I wonder if that's so, how. It would be a nice surprise in the morning, but. I wonder if that's how John Ostrom came up with the idea that birds are dinosaurs. Just had a hit of like weed or whatever, and was sat there staring and was sat there like. Dodonicus looks a bit like a bird, doesn't it? <laughs> it came to him in a vision. Just starts... A, an LSD trip. Just starts scribbling down random shit. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out to be right. Well, once in a blue moon, it's right. They said they're hailing him as the greatest paleontologist right. ever, and he's just sat back looking like, I just smoked some weed. What are you on about? <laughs> <laughs> That's how real science is done. The real discoveries are made yes. at the end of a bong. The wacky weed. <laughs> Alright, uh, are there other questions? Or is that the last one? No, that was that was it. One thing I will just do quickly is send you okay, the but... Meg video. <laughs> so you can check it out in the morning or it whatever. It is a school night for me, so... So I do have to head out soon. It is a school night. Yep, thought so. Alright, what did the Megalodon eat? <laughs> the Megalodon scavenger. Uh, it's a long commute for me. Yeah, he originally... 
He originally published that idea in, I think it was um, 2016 or 2019. Got a lot of flack for it, and now he's made a video explaining it. <laughs> oh, also, uh, yes, that's what they needed. They just, they just didn't get it. They just needed a video to under, to understand it. If I remember correctly, also in 2020, but they just couldn't. He and someone else wrote a scientific paper where they claimed that they figured out how pliosaurs uh, sl swam. Uh, but if I remember correctly, that was already concluded in like twen uh, 2008. So, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. found that kind of funny. So he's just, he's just going whatever at the fan. Supernatural Survivor with Max Hawthorne. That's what this channel is called. Yes. He's also made claims uh. that Mosasaurs might still be alive in the modern day, but I think that's more so him hopping on something that already exists. And then just, like, going his own route. Okay, I've I've never heard of this guy before. Well, if what you're saying is true, then that's just absolutely insane. I I definitely would have noticed. <laughs> Who knows? A Forty foot Mosasaur swimming around. Well, like I said to you, um, well, you could I mean, do, I guess do videos on it. I guess you, you analyzing, see if he's got any points. <laughs> I doubt it, but. But just make fun of him. That seems more like a video idea for the future. Oh, there's one other really good paleontologist called uh, like Harris Sang. Harris Tang. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, but he like he'll go through um, a lot of really bad paleontology videos. Oh yeah. And do a commentary and play by play on them. I remember actually. Um, I remember so he I, did I like a video. No, it was a community post he did where he said something like um. Oh. Can't use Wikipedia all the time. Do you know any good websites I could quickly refer to for videos? And I remember people were saying stuff like Mark Whitten's blog, Scientific Journals, blah, 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 blah. And that's where I just went to him. You know, uh, one website I like yeah. to use is this one, Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs, Polish website. It has, it covers pretty much every dinosaur, and they constantly have new pages up for every new discovered dinosaur. And I remember, I think my comment on that post got the most <laughs> likes. So I think people very much liked it. And then I remember uh, watching one of his videos after that, and I noticed he was going, uh, whenever someone said, like, oh, this dinosaur weighed X amount, he'd go, no, 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 it actually weighed this. And I just left a comment saying, based on the weights you're giving, I think you're using the website I suggested. Thanks. <laughs> so I found that pretty cool. <laughs> Alright, you took your advice. Well, if you don't lost, like, comment, then... Yeah, I was gonna take your advice. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I, yeah, I do find that a good, another good source. Like, when actual paleontologists have, like, blogs... Uh, blog posts. Well, hey, you should see the list I've built up for a oh, video on helpful. Brachiosaurus. I built up a massive list, and, like, half of the sources listed are just blog posts from Sawpod Vertebrae Picture of the Week. That's just it. <laughs> Wait, sorry, you cut out a bit for me there. Oh, um, I said of how, uh, I got Sauropod. a project yeah. in the work for, um, Brachiosaurus video, and I've gotten a massive list of different sources, and, like, half of them are from Sauropod Vertebrae Picture of the Week. Oh. <laughs> Something like, I think 16 out of 37 are from Sauropod Vertebrae Picture of the Week. <laughs> Hey, is this a website? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, okay. This is pretty cool. Yeah, that Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs. I haven't of, seen these guys before. Um, there's this one book called Dinosaur Facts and Figures: The Theropods and Other Dinosaur Forms. There's also one on sauropods available, and um, that book actually is. They have that website listed in their bibliography, so I decided to uh, check it out, and I've been using it ever since for videos. It's pretty cool. It's always good to have source because sometimes, like, you can't, like, oh, you know, there's some information out there, we just can't find it. And you're just like, mm. it's a struggle sometimes. I've like, sometimes there's a dinosaur that's, like, just really obscure and there's barely any information online about it. Yeah. You should see the it's amount of bookmarks I have because I just bookmark all the different websites and blogs I've used. 
or um, think I'll end up using in the future. <laughs> right, so I have bookmarked like all, uh, most, if not okay. all, of the versions of Nature's Tetrapod Zoology and um, uh, all these different general information type websites like the one I just sent you, uh, Prehistoric Wildlife, even though that website gets a bit of a shit and it's uh, considered a bit of a meme in the community. And um, also the Internet Archive as well. I just right, bookmark... It's a little... It's, it's, it's not... I just bookmark everything and uh, just use whatever I think is best. So that way I can just quickly access it. So Brachiosaurus yeah. video, so I just go through all the blogs and see what I can find. I think I gathered something like 50 sources on Brachiosaurus. Uh, from all the different blogs I went through and general info <laughs> websites. <laughs> Which is, that's like... Just for one video or something on Brachiosaurus. That's double what my Alamosaurus video is. That, I think that was something like 28 sources. <laughs> that's... That's the definition of thorough. <laughs> well, might as that's well grab... Insane. Like I said, I'll just grab everything. Even if it might repeat a lot of info, right? Because some of the websites I've used are fandom wikis. So you have stuff like the Dinopedia fandom, mm -hmm. then you have others they recommend like Paleontology fandom wiki, or a Fossil wiki, but, but I still use them anyway, just in case there might be something else there. Right, like that extra step of info. Yeah. Like, um, I've been working on a Lion vs. Right. Tiger video, yeah. and I have this book that I have yet to use on it yet, well I haven't been using on it, called, uh... Uh, Wildcats from 1964 or 1969, something like that. But uh, the other night, I decided to read through it anyway, just in case there might be something interesting for that video. It might not be that much, since it's a very old yeah. book, but it might be something. Something new. Something different. Yeah. And not just that, but I noticed quite a few of these older books yeah. I've read through on cats. They... Some of them seem to talk a lot about the behavior, or like just certain aspects that um, newer books don't. Alright, because most of it will just be like general information, like, oh, their habitat is this, this is their typical prey. Um, I know some of the older books, they do talk about that sort of stuff, but there's others they seem to talk about as well. Like, um, I don't know, sort of like lion taming example. Right, like for circuses and stuff, I've seen that in some of these older books, oh. or like hybrids of lions, but I don't oh. see that in the newer books. So I find that interesting. That's also why I like using older hmm. books sometimes, because you never know what you might find. Yeah, yeah, some very old stuff that hasn't really been addressed lately. The knowledge that might have gone to the wayside. Hmm. Well, like, I don't know why. I don't know why that would happen, but. Yeah, it'd be interesting to reference, talk about. Well, not just that, but think about it, like. I, yeah, I noticed that a lot of the. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot, a lot of the websites kind of like repeat the same stuff and the same information, like especially like some of the fan websites, like they literally just copy and paste from Wikipedia. I remember. <laughs> it's like, well, thanks. That was. Thanks for that. I remember for a while sort of being hooked on the whole thing of like theropod dinosaurs versus T Rex and all that, and I remember thinking of doing a video of five dinosaurs that could actually beat T Rex. And I was reading through a lot of these fandom websites when it comes to a section I was writing on Triceratops, right? Because I was going to have that on the list because, you know, most of the time predators fail to succeed in the hunt. So Triceratops, Ankylosaurus, those yeah. would be pretty obvious picks. But um, I noticed after a while of me reading through all these fandom websites, I was just sat back thinking, you've just copy and pasted all the same paragraphs, haven't you? So I just went, like, who copied who here? And then I just started to cut most of them out and just went with the fandom wiki on a Dinopedia. Because <laughs> just after a while it did my head in, right. like, what the I, hell? I might use something like... Yeah? Yeah. I, I might use something like that just to get, like, a... Like a baseline kind of general knowledge. Alright, what is this creature and what is it about? And then go from there, like, find some more information on there. On, on the animal and not rely too heavily on that fandom stuff yeah the main reason <laughs> I've only used them um, well the main reason I've used the fandom wikis like Dinopedia fandom has been um just because well uh if I'm going to call it a fandom wiki they actually list off like popular cultural media appearances of certain dinosaurs and I do like to have the oh, chill yeah and I do like to include those so uh 
that makes it easier. So yeah, I'm not just sat back like. Yeah, that's good for more footage to find. So I'm not just sat back like, oh god, when when has this thing appeared in Paleo Media or whatever? Right, I can just go to <laughs> Fandom Wiki and go, oh okay, it's appeared here, 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 here. Or um. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, beyond that, I don't really like. Well, I've been trying not to trust the fandoms too much because there could always be like an outdated piece of information or they might not source something for whatever claim they might have on there. Uh, that might be some wacky, I don't know, I mean, something weird. For me, it's like, or outdated. For me, it's like how many of these would be like 12 year olds writing? So it's going to be like, oh, in my opinion, uh, this dinosaur should be lumped with this other one. Meanwhile, with something like yeah, it's uh, just. Meanwhile, with some of the other websites you get out there, like um, I don't know, uh, Nature's Tetrapod Zoology, you can go like, oh, okay, if he says that, you can go, it's just his opinion. <laughs> meanwhile, it's like with this right, sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Meanwhile, with the Dinopedia fandom, it's like, that. if you see some claim on there that this thing is valid or not, it's like, is this someone's just opinion? Uh, where's the source citation? Because I noticed that on some of their articles, they don't seem to have source citations. They never... It seems to fluctuate depending on which article I read. Right. Their Stegosaurus one had multiple different uh, papers. Just... But then, when I checked out, I think it was their Fire Like a Leo uh, page, there wasn't really anything. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's why it's, like, kind of good for understanding like a baseline general knowledge of okay what is this creature but then like to cite it as a source it's not like trustworthy just kind of back it up with something else like with wikipedia right you could read it get a general knowledge of what you want to know but then uh, supplement that back it up with something okay, more what are, authoritative um <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, you should see the uh, collection. That's what I do. That's my process. Well, you should see the collection of books I have. <laughs> I have everything in terms of credibility <laughs> from bloody. Um, who's someone not really that credible? Oh yeah, uh, I have everything from the credibility of children's encyclopedias all the way up to highly respected authors like Robert Backer. And then, <laughs> so um. Ah, uh, there's so much out there. Huh. And I constantly hope to uh, expand my library. You should see the amount of stuff I've favorited on the Internet Archive. <laughs> I've just... It's... I have a habit, okay? <laughs> that's, that's the entire it's a thing. problem. <laughs> just, I need this one book. Like, if you... Like that thing I suggested earlier, it'd be interesting to see you do a video on, I don't know, is Megalania still alive, or, I don't know, Philakalia, if it's still alive. It's just going to be the sort of thing where you don't need to do any research, just have me go like, okay, so anyway, according to these six books I got recently, <laughs> and just go from there. According to this uh, local man who claims to have seen something with his cows and... <laughs> Like, uh, yeah, yeah. So, I try to, I try to find sources that are. Well, I also try to find videos talking about it, and maybe the videos can point you to, Something. like a journal or pu publication about it. Yeah, that that's why I'm a big. Uh, or you'll have it in their in sources. It. Yeah, I've sort of. With some right. exceptions I watch uh, here and there, I've pretty much stopped watching any YouTubers who don't list their sources, right? Because it's one of those things where it's like, well, if they list their sources, then if there might be some helpful information I need for a video, and they're talking about that thing in the video, I can just go through their sources. Yeah. Right? And then it helps, like, when, yeah, when you want to talk about it and expand on it. It's easy to find. Or, who knows, they might reference a book I have, or something I follow throughout the video, so I can actually fact check them. Like, um, uh, one video I watched recently from the YouTube channel Wild World, who covers stuff like cryptozoology, modern animals, prehistoric, all that. It's a pretty good channel overall. Uh, he did a video recently on the whole lion vs. tiger debate. I remember one book he referenced there was Cats of Africa by Luke Hunter. 
and I actually have a physical copy of that book. So, um, with the part he uh, that's refer- pretty cool. With the part where he referenced that book, I can actually go and check that book and see if what he's saying is true. And um, I can confirm that what he said there when referencing that book is true about uh, line mains and how effective they are in protection. So, uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. That's pretty cool. You have the sacred text. You were there when it was written. One of the things I found pretty cool also was um, I did a video on lions. And uh, he actually shouted out my lion video in that video, saying of how there's a lot of stuff in my video on oh, size so and uh, also main. <laughs> I remember being so excited when I saw that. I remember just going, <laughs> going like, "Hey, Dad, check this out! My lion video." God, it's such an exciting, like, like weird experience, right? Mm. Like someone actually references you. <laughs> 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 it, it takes getting used to. It's hard. Yeah, it's just—it's weird. Like, wait, am I actually? <laughs> People actually take me seriously. That's weird. Why? Although at the same time, I also find it pretty cool. It's a bit of advertising. I remember also. Um. Well, this was. Yeah, I reckon. Too. I reckon this is the way he actually found out about my line video, because I remember actually reaching out to him like a month or two before that video he did came out, telling him I was working on a video on lions. So I asked him. Could he do a video on how big lions can get? Because he has a series of, like, how big certain animals can get. So I found that pretty cool that he actually ended up saying, hey, go check out the this video I did. And I remember a couple weeks after I sent off that email to him, I also sent him material, research material, on um, how big pumas can get. So uh, he said that when he, did that, when he does that video, he would definitely credit me for that. So I found that pretty cool. Again, bit of free advertising. Yeah, yeah. As like, I mean, it's not like uh, I'm just. I mean, it's not, I'm just like some yeah. kid, and <laughs> I'm just like guy with the computer. Am I really worth fighting? I mean, like, I didn't even. He didn't like even ask me or anything. Of like, um, could you give me stuff on how big pumas can get? I was just like, you know, what, I feel the need to send this off to him for some reason. So I did. <laughs> In case you're wondering what's the largest puma I've found. Alright, it's... Yeah? It... Yeah, it's about to hit midnight, so I should... Yeah. I should head out now. Yeah, should go. By the way, in case you're wondering what's the largest puma I've found... Yeah, um, well, uh, midnight over here. But yeah, yeah, yeah finish off. Uh, largest puma I found was... I think it was... Well, the largest one I found listed was 170 kilos, so, um, just going kilos to pounds, that is 170 kilos, 375 pounds, but, um, that one's not counted, that's considered dubious, the actual largest puma recognised weighed 125 kilos, or, which is, uh, with the organs removed, by the way, so it would have been heavier, but that equals to about 275 pounds, so, big boy. That's that for a puma. That's massive. Yeah. Well, I remember reading something saying the average for males in I think Chile uh, in Can- Chile and Canada is something like around seventy kilos, which is what one hundred and fifty pounds. So this thing was big. But you're um, a. I'll let you head off now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. Thanks. Uh, I'll let you know I, when the. I had a lot of fun with the questions and talking. Indeed. I'll let you know when the uh, podcast thing is yeah. up so you can share it. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely. I'll uh, put a post on my YouTube channel about it yep. uh, and link it in there. More free advertising. Um, no, like, really interesting questions. <laughs> More free advertising, yeah. <laughs> um, and honestly, I had fun. I had fun discussing these things with you because I, I didn't expect to be so like-minded in a lot of things, mm-hmm. or, or to get hit with some of those hard questions like uh, politics and stuff. But it, it was fun to talk about. It reminds me of the last couple. I like of... hearing your yeah take. Thanks. But yeah, it reminds me of some of the other people I've had on the podcast so far, yeah. where I'm just sat there like, finally, a conservative paleo person, <laughs> not some loony liberal. <laughs> 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 it was nice not getting screeched at today. I appreciate that. <laughs> How dare you say there's only uh, two I mean, genders? 
I, I appreciate talking about paleontology with someone who's like knowledgeable about it and has good questions, has good insight. You've clearly done a lot of your research, yeah, which is cool. And I, I really wish you all the best, man. Thanks. Uh, by the way, just as one video request, right. could you do a video on the validity of Sorophaganax? That question's been bugging me for a while. Oh, oh, that would be fun. That sounds fun. I'll <laughs> take that. I'll take that challenge. That's gonna be like an uh, hour long video. A pretty, pretty rap. <laughs> Uh, my schedule's pretty tight for now. I'm finishing the Land Before Time video. Yep. Um, but I'll, I'll get to it, and I'll have to review life when I plan it, but I'll, I'll definitely get to that. Cool. I'll get to that soon, within the next few months. Awesome. Alright. So, Alright. Yeah, see ya. Anything else? Nah, that's it. All right. I'll just message you anything man. else. Good Thank night. You. Okay, awesome. See ya. See ya. Thank you.